All right. Uh, welcome, everybody, to today's uh, Thursday session. A little bit uh, of a different um, presentation today. Came up with uh, some of the initiatives that I've been working on, um, and it's been a while since I had a kind of an overall update anyway. So I think the last Sunday session, I want to say, was in late July or so. And it's just been taking some time off here uh, over the summer. Um living life in California, but also working on a few things. So with that, I think one of the things that I had mentioned maybe a couple months ago was that White Tundra overall as a entity per se um, is kind of moving from coverage of all the 55 to 60 companies um, in the price targets list to more so the focused presentations on the uh, private placements that we've done, some of the smaller junior companies, and then the uh, small to mid caps that are in the portfolio kind of focus more quality DD on them as opposed to the quantity of trying to cover everything. Um, that being said, definitely going to still keep up with uh, all the earnings and the well results and whatever uh, possible. Um, share that on my feed and then during these presentations as well. So just a little bit of a focus change. The coverage uh, kind of stays the same. Um, just with less focus on the other companies, which have been uh, pretty well discussed. And also I find they're being well covered by other people um, through Twitter or through other presentations. So kind of going to let let that part go and really focus on this. So with that, I think one of the one of the big things that's that's been happening is um, some of the junior companies and the smaller caps, they have uh, obviously okay. stories that are much more complex. They have stories that have a lot more nuance to them than a bigger company uh, where things just get kind of swept under the radar um, or, or not really noticed. So what I mean by that is, let's say there's a company that's making 40, 50, 100,000 uh, BOEs per day. If they make an acquisition of, of uh, 2,000 BOEs, well, maybe it's not even announced. Maybe it just gets stuck in there as a minor acquisition. If they buy some land, maybe it's not even announced. Um, if they go out and do some sort of enhanced oil recovery project, okay, maybe they tripled production on, on their uh, little pool, but um, it doesn't really make that much difference because they're already making 100,000 uh, BOEs per day. And same applies to new drill results, uh, both good and bad. So when you have a big company, um, you know, many people may be surprised to hear this, but they, they all report 100% success rates on their drilling, um, that, that doesn't necessarily mean that all the wells were good. They There's there's a lot of wells out there uh, being drilled by the uh, small cap, well, small to mid caps and the major companies um, that are not that good. They produce five barrels, 10 barrels right off the bat. Some of them are basically abandoned right away uh, because they're uneconomic to go and uh, uh, tie into the main facilities. So this this all happens behind the scenes it's not really noticed in bigger companies because it just doesn't matter as much. Uh, it's more a game of probability and 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 statistics uh, as opposed to one or two wells. Whereas on the small cap and the junior side, uh, everything matters. So every every single thing. Um, okay, just give me one sec here. There's I guess somebody's unmuted. Um, okay, yeah. So on the hopefully that's better now. If if there's other uh, audio coming in, just um, let me know and I can fix it too as well. Uh, yeah. So, um, yeah, on, on the smaller companies, the junior companies, obviously each individual decision that's made every month of production, everything is just carefully checked. It's carefully looked at because it matters that much more and because it affects the company's cash flow that much more. Of course, that being both a downside and the upside in that uh, you're taking a more concentrated bet on 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 uh, certain things working out. At the same time, if those do, uh, if those things do work out, you get the uh, outsized benefit of that. So with that, I think it's very important that uh, when when White Tundra or myself, I'm announcing that, hey, we're, we're gonna be participating in a placement or taking a bigger position in a certain, uh, a smaller name to share as much as possible of the DD that I'm doing. Uh, the due diligence and the work that's put in, um, not, not all of it obviously makes it out uh, into the recordings or or makes it out into the Twitter feed. So with that, uh, moving forward, I think uh, I had shared earlier that 
Uh, I've got a newsletter coming out that's going to cover the smaller names uh, that we're involved with. Uh, it's been kind of delayed here a uh, month or so, uh, but still, still looking forward to get that out here as soon as possible. And then also uh, do some of these very, very focused uh, update sessions. I think not all of them are going to be um, shared on my feed per se. There, there might be smaller ones that I do um, that are that are just uh, shared on the website or uh, done and then and then recorded and then posted afterwards. Um, just given, I I don't want this to become a I just continually cover these smaller names given the sensitivity of how fast they can move um, and how illiquid some of them are on the public markets. So with that, uh, today we're we're going to cover Prospera. Um, Energy, obviously a name that uh, has been in the White Tundra portfolio for over a year at this point, uh, but the major investment was made in uh, January 2023 uh, with the non-brokered private placement, entered through that, and then really been uh, following the company, helping them as much as possible in a arm's length uh, sense, and uh, also sharing as much as I can on, on the name. So with with the this company specifically, the story now has gotten to a point where okay, the the comment was when are we going to get the drilling program going? When when is this actually going to start? Well, now we started, so we are now on the second well. Uh, the first well was spotted August nineteenth, uh, took about seven days, and then the second well was spotted August twenty sixth, and um, you know should be getting close to a TD at this point, and uh, we'll just continue tracking that. So so for anybody that wants to track it. Uh, there's a free website called Rigor Talk, R I G G E R T A L K dot uh, com, and they have the latest uh, information. The rig currently being used is the Lasso uh, Drilling Four. So, if you just look that up on there, uh, you can track the uh, where where that rig currently is, and then as it moves from from well to well. So, um, yeah. Before I begin here, a uh, few things up front. I'm not an investment advisor, so everything I share today is my own opinion uh, and interpretation of the situation. But please do your own due diligence on what you're seeing. Uh, this is especially important with these smaller names, these junior names. There's there's always nuance here. There's always caveats. Uh, not every single piece of information can be shared. Um, there's there's definitely uh, a lot of more more focus on the smaller things with these. Uh, junior names, everything matters, as I had said earlier. Uh, please also check your own risk tolerance and portfolio construction. These these two things are very, very important uh, when you're looking at some of the smaller names. Uh, oil is inherently a very volatile sector. Um, and then on top of that, you're saying uh, there's a risk component to it uh, that may be magnified depending on your interpretation uh, on some of the smaller names. And then you have your portfolio construction. So what percentage of your portfolio are you putting into certain equities or certain kinds of equities? Um, so I'll leave that there. And then if anybody on Twitter spaces would like to join for the Zoom uh, session, it's on the website, whitetundra.ca. Scroll to the bottom under events and uh, the Zoom will be there. Uh, it will be recorded as will the Twitter spaces. So uh, for anybody that's unable to make it. So yeah, I think with that, we'll begin. Um, Today is going to be a just a general due diligence session. So there's a few things that I've been looking at adjacent pools. I've been looking at the polymer floods, the other horizontal drills into the manville. Uh, so some information shared on that. And then really uh, there's been a number of concerns that have been brought up, uh, which I'll be addressing. Um, not all the concerns are, let's say, fake. The Some concerns are legitimate. Some concerns are misleading. And then some concerns are just blatantly wrong. So um, I think I'll share what my opinion is on all of them. Um, if there's any other issues, of course, or or concerns, please feel free to email me. I've taken many emails, many DMs, uh, many text messages uh, over, over this name and then the other smaller names that uh, we're involved with. So please feel free to uh, keep that communication going. I, I like to do more DD. If there's something that I'm not seeing, that ha that hasn't been brought up yet, uh, you know, send me a message and I'll I'll look into it or I'll... Uh, talk to management directly and and try and figure out um, the answers to those questions. Because of course, I myself have a huge position in this company. So uh, if there's anything that somebody figures out from a field level or engineering level or a corporate level, um, I would want to be the first one to know because of the significant amount of money invested into this name. So with that, I think uh, we will begin here. 
So a couple of the wells, um, for those that, that haven't been following Prospera, maybe this, this, this might be a bit of a unknown to you. Uh, this presentation is really catered to those who are following the story and know a bit of the background. Uh, I'm not going to be going and, and explaining every single thing. Uh, if you are looking for a more basic uh, understanding, I've got podcasts and also uh, a couple of Sunday sessions on the name uh, that I've done previously that are on the YouTube already. So this was one of the two drills that they sidetracked last year. Uh, the one drill, as we know, uh, the formation had caved in, which I'll discuss later on here. Uh, that well had to be abandoned. The second well here is, is the second sidetrack. Came on about 40, 45 barrels per day. It went down in the winter in uh, January, February time, um, producing at a pretty decent uh, water cut, very normal for this area. When you have something producing at 90, 95% water cut, no need to be alarmed. That's uh, pretty normal. We used to produce wells when I worked in this area that were 99.5% water cut, no problem. Uh, as long as you have the water disposal capacity or the water injection capacity, and then uh, obviously the transportation of that, these things are relatively normal. We're just skimming oil. Um, this being a bit of a different situation because obviously it was a new uh, sidetrack. So production is a little bit higher than some of these uh, so-called stripper wells um, that are in the area. So the well was brought, uh, brought back online in April, about 30, 35 barrels per day. It's now down to about 30 barrels per day and uh, continuing on. So hoping to see here uh, the production stay in this 30 plus barrel per day range. The thing about the Manville formation is sure, we don't have these very, very high IP rates um, that are gonna go out and, and shock people. Uh, at the same time, you have a very, very low decline reservoir. So you produce X amount of barrels and we want it to stay at a very low decline rate uh, for many, many years and then keep cash flowing for years to come. Um, the second benefit of having a low decline asset is it's easier to sell. So you're 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 not as worried about inventory depth when you have something that's declining 50% a year. Well, now you need to keep drilling wells to keep your production flat, uh, let alone grow anything. So it becomes a lot harder for that to be attractive to a potential buyer if you don't have the inventory in the ground. Um, in this case, you have a lower decline base, so a company can buy it. They don't have to put in uh, huge amounts of money into the into the operation to keep production flat. If they want to grow it, of course, you got to put more money into it. But the low decline nature is really why heavy oil has always had an appeal anyway, um, especially in a higher oil price environment. So some of the wells we'll just go through. Some of the other wells. Uh, this is a well that was drilled in 2013, a horizontal. As you can see, came on about 50, 60 barrels per day. It stayed in the call it 30 to 40 barrel per day range for the next four years, uh, three to four years, and then fell off um, into the 10 barrel per day range. Doesn't look like this one was supported by, uh, by any water injection, um, but I don't have the water graph here. So um, I think, you know, overall pretty decent. Should I, what I'd like for the production to stay a little bit higher for longer, definitely. Uh, but getting that 30 to 40 barrels for about five years, uh, overall pretty good and then stayed at the 10 barrels, obviously went down in 2020 and then was brought back on in uh, Q1 of 2022. Since then, it's been at this uh, seven to 10 barrel per day range. So uh, especially with these some of these older wells, once they get down to this, let's say five to 10 barrel per day range, we definitely want to see it staying there uh, because that's, that's roughly uh, where it makes sense to continue operating these wells, to continue fixing these wells, if there's parted rods, if you have a broken pump, if you have a uh, any sort of a hole in the tubing, et cetera, you can go in and do a service job and bring the well back online. Once they get down to the one or two barrel per day range, they're still economic to operate. But if they go down, now you have a decision to make because you might spend $30,000 on a rig job. And is it really going to be economic for you if it's a six month payout to go and do that? Um, given that the well might break again. So I think would like to see a lot of the well stay in this range. Um, you know, that's that's an analysis that you're going to have to do well by well by well. Um, so far, it's looking pretty good. They've got a lot of wells online um, and some new ones coming online as well as the workovers continue. Here's an example of the 95% water cut that I was talking about. So producing about 10 barrels per day here. And we see the liquid rate was up to 2,000 barrels per day. So what is that? A 99.5% water cut. The well continued to chug along 
until it went down. So this well went down in Q3 of 2016, has been shut in for seven years and likely one of the wells on the workover list uh, to be brought back online, especially if there's a bank oil near it with the water floods uh, in the area. So lots of opportunity. I'm just showing this as one example of the continual uh, workovers and reactivations that are going on. Uh, the nice thing about a well that's been down for this long is you could get some flush production. So once a well has been down for that long, the oil comes to the top slightly, the water goes to the bottom, just a uh, density density of liquids uh, sort of calculation. And uh, we'll see how they come out. Not Not every well is easy to work over. When you have a company that's coming out of a long extended period of wells being down, you don't just want to go and start working over every well. You want to do it in a priority fashion uh, where there's certain wells that are uh, easier, cheaper to fix. There's certain wells that are more expensive and there's certain wells that may be gone for good. So even though there was nothing wrong with the well or there was a small thing wrong with it five or seven years ago, the formation might have uh, produced a bunch of sand into the cellar and now you can't, you can't go into it and work it over or it's a lot more expensive. So that well then becomes an, an, an abandonment candidate if there's no other zone uh, that's of interest in the area. So this is more of a watch as you go. Uh, it would be very nice if some of these smaller companies shared exactly which wells they were going to work over. But I'm, I think, dreaming here, uh, asking for too much and, and, and too much micromanaging, I guess. So we'll sort of let it be. I'll track them as we go. And then maybe as the company is onto greener pastures, um, I'm I'm very interested in going back and uh, looking at some of the wells that haven't been brought back, and uh, sort of asking the company, hey, what's what's the plan with these wells? Are you going to bring these back? Can I put them into the some sort of future model, or are we just going to leave them uh, because there's there's uh, potentially something wrong with them um, going forward? Uh, different well, so we see one more here. This one went down at the same time in 2016. Same thing, about 99% water cut, and it was brought back online in 2022. So you can see here what I said about the workovers is not is not just me making up uh, things about wells can be brought back online. Here's the example um, of a well that was brought back online. It produced for a little bit in 2022. You can see the production rates actually pretty good. When you see the uh, legend on the left side here, the liquids rate, the, the first level is 200 barrels per day. And we're producing about 15 to 20 barrels per day here uh, on, on the restart. And there's your flush production. So you can see when the well went down, we we're making maybe four to six barrels per day. When it came online, it came on at 15 to 20 barrels per day. So that oil accumulates, you get that flush production. We should never use the flush production number as, as your long-term uh, production uh, number going forward. It's always gonna come down from that as some of that oil on the top just gets produced. And then you see a re, uh, re movement back into your regular rate um, at low decline. Unfortunately, this well also did not survive the winter of 2022 when Prospera had a lot of issues uh, dealing with the very, very cold climate. So the well has just come back online, but it didn't have enough hours in, in the last month to make a reasonable conclusion um, as to where it is. but. You can see here these these wells. There's many of these opportunities that are still there. Um, my guess is that some of these are are now getting to the more expensive ones, um, which is why they're not quite targeting these yet. They're going to wait, do the drilling program, get the production up, and then come back to these wells um, in order to go and put some money into this. When I say more expensive, maybe they went from a thirty thousand dollar rig job to something that's fifty, sixty, seventy. And then there's going to be certain wells in the portfolio that maybe you have to redo everything uh, could cost a couple hundred a couple hundred thousand dollars or more. There's also certain wells, which it's not the well that's the problem. It's that some of the surface equipment might have been taken out. So over seven year period, uh, a different well, let's say went down, you needed a engine for it. Okay, now you come to this well that was shut in. You grab the engine, you took it there. You took some of the valves there. You took some of the meters out. You took the separator out and you put it somewhere else. So it only makes sense to restart these wells if maybe there's four wells on a site and you're going to fix them all and then rebuild the uh, surface equipment. So um, definitely a few different parameters to keep in mind. Um, it's not as simple as what does it take to fix the well? It's it's what does it take to fix the well and get it flowing 
um, and producing oil in a consistent manner. Um, okay, so there's a question here, what is flush production? So uh, again, flush production is basically when you have a well that's shut in for multiple years, the oil and the water separate such that the oil, because it's a lower density, uh, will move will move to the top of the formation so that when you restart the well, you will get the slug of oil to begin with, and then that tapers off into your uh, normalized rate. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, there's another question here. Why why do these wells go down normally? So many, many, many reasons. They're the most common reason why well would go down, as in temporarily go down, is because of something wrong with the surface equipment. So you could have an engine that's running these wells blow a gasket or, or blow a cylinder and you can no longer use it. Now you have to go and fix it. You could have a one of the meters on the on site fail and have a bunch of wax deposition in there, block off the flow. Now the well goes down. All of this is mostly automated. If there's high pressure, if there's high temperature, um, if it uh, notices that there's a leak of any sort, they will auto shut down until the operator the operator gets to site the next day uh, and sees what's going on. Some wells are SCADA connected, so they have remote uh, operation capabilities, in which case an alarm or a text is sent out um, to the operator notifying them that, hey, this well has gone down. If they deem that the well is important enough, they will go and fix it overnight. If they think, hey, this well only makes five barrels per day or two barrels per day, uh, it, it can wait till the morning, then they'll wait till the morning. There's an economic decision um, that you as an operator have to make uh, when you get that call. The other thing that can go wrong, obviously, is the winter on site. Um, this has been something that has affected Prospira a lot. When you have an oil that is a 980 density oil, uh, 12 API, very, very heavy, lots of waxes, lots of sulfur, lots of asphaltines, it doesn't like to flow to begin with. When you have minus 30, minus 40 Celsius, it definitely doesn't like to flow. Uh, it's the same reason why when you're driving your truck or your vehicle in the winter, you're supposed to let it warm up for a few minutes uh, to let that oil warm up and get to a uh, lower viscosity stage so that you're not causing problems with your engine uh, or any of the components. So same, same logic applies. Um, that's on the surface side. When you have a major problem that the well goes down for an extended period of time, it's usually downhole. So you can have your pump seize up. So if you produce too much gas from your pump, well, guess what rubber and steel doesn't like? It doesn't like gas. It likes to be lubricated. So it likes oil and it it kind of likes water, but not really. Uh, it really likes the oil lubrication as you're pumping that oil uh, up your tubing. So your pump could be a problem. You could have a problem with the tubing. So as, as you're producing oil up the tubing, there could be some sand with it. There could be some wax with it, some other gunk comes up from, from the reservoir and it creates a hole in your tubing. Well, then you can't pump it up because everything you're pumping up is just going and flowing down back the well. So uh, back down the well, I should say. So hole in the tubing. The other one is parted rods. So when you have a PCP pump, when you have a pump jack, um, if your rod snaps or breaks because it's spinning 300 times a minute, well, you can't pump anymore. So now you got to go down and fix that. So those are the biggest problems uh, I've seen. And then also sand. If you have a lot of sand accumulation in your reservoir and your fluid is not able to carry it up the well effectively, uh, sometimes your pump can seize up with that too, uh, or you can cause sand bridges where your entire pipe, uh, uh, your entire tubing gets blocked off with sand and sand just solidifies and you, you're not going to be able to break it up. So you have to pull everything out, clean out your cellar, and then uh, uh, restart the well. So those are some of the issues. Uh, of course, you can have problems with the pump jack or the PCP. You can have problems with the hydraulic system. The, like This is a pretty complex operation, but it's also a very simple operation in that uh, it's relatively easy to figure out what's gone wrong. Um, you know, I wish I wish I could have done a video on site uh, of some sort uh, because there's all these simple tests you can do to figure out what exactly went wrong. Um, by by shutting in the casing or shutting in the tubing, um, letting the letting your PCP run a certain way, uh, 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 kicking out your hydraulics, etc., and you can figure out okay where is my rods uh, broken, where is my hole in the tubing. You can actually figure out where in your uh, a downhole the problem is, 
uh, by doing certain kinds of tests. So, so it's pretty cool stuff because obviously you can't see downhole, uh, but you can figure out what to tell the service rig, how many joints of tubing do, uh, do they need to bring, how long do you think the rig job is going to be, um, and the AFE, uh, et cetera, on it. Uh, so with that, I hope that answered the question. I'm happy to share more um, if there's anything else. So, so this is one of the wells that was worked over, obviously. Um, more to come. I am tracking many of these wells very closely uh, because I want to see what the flush production is, what the extended long-term production is, and then which wells are they bringing back um, as time goes on. And if we just go back to this, this, this well here, we see there's an injector very close by to it. So this is a water injector. We can see the water injector was started in 05. It really kicked on in 2012. So in 2012, the rate was more than doubled. The water injection rate was more than doubled. And then you see in 2018, uh, when Prospera really started to suffer because of just, just lack of management, um, uh, ability to take care of the operations, the water injection just went down. So it went all the way down from 4,500 barrels per day to in 2020, it was about 2,000 barrels per day and then down to uh, 500 barrels per day in 2021. This really affects your operations. When you have an enhanced oil recovery water flood, you need that consistent profile on the amount of water you're giving to the reservoir and the amount of pressure you're giving to the, uh, the reservoir. Uh, the water is not just there to push the oil. It's also providing the pressure support to the reservoir um, itself. And you can see how it played out in this well. We have this, this big uptick in water production in 2012 as the injection ramped up. We see the water stayed there for a while, but but didn't really increase the oil production. So what does that tell you? That the that the water was just basically sweeping through the reservoir uh, without actually bringing the oil with it. So a few things it tells you. It tells you the water flood was not being managed properly. Uh, it tells you that you're injecting possibly too fast because you're pushing, you're just pushing past the uh, the oil without grabbing it on the way. You wanna maybe lower the injection rate in this case. It's telling you that there's upside here to fixing up the water flood. And also it's telling you there's upside on the polymer flood because essentially all a polymer does is slow down the water. The water can't break through the polymer. It has to go and push it slowly. Therefore, this, this wasn't managed properly. You have all this oil left in place, um, possibly why they, why they chose to restart this well. Uh, because they want to do some of these uh, secondary and tertiary recovery activities uh, as the months and the years go by here. Here's another well. So just going back to the history, you can see vertical wells make in more than 300 barrels per day. So some of these vertical wells uh, in the in the Manville, in the heavy oil formations have been prolific. Uh, when you drill into some of these and they have bottom water drive or they have aquifers, they can produce a lot of oil naturally. Uh, without needing any sort of water flood. So, um, you know, we're talking multi-millions of barrels of oil in place per section. So you can get really, really good rates, um, especially if you've got a nice pump that is that is pumping nice and slow. You can see how long these rates stay. So when this well was, was producing, it produced over 300 barrels per day for three years. Other than this 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 drawdown it had here, let's say that was a year. So, so it produced over 300 barrels per day still for three years. That's what I'm talking about when I say low decline uh, production. No, no other formation other than heavy oil does this. You, you, you don't get this in a Montney well. You don't get this in a Viking well. You don't get this in the Permian. They, they all decline. You don't even get it in, in, in your usual conventional Sparky wells or Frobishers or Mydales. This is really exclusive to the heavy oil Manville formation uh, that you end up getting these kinds of wells. And what's the great thing about these wells? Well, once you have it, it just cash flows out. It, it'll cash flow the first year, the same as what it cash flows the second year and the third year and possibly even the fourth year. That's what you want when you're building a company, when you're putting money in the ground and you don't really have that access to capital. You don't want to drill a well and a year later, you're at 20% of the production that it IP'd at. It's very, very hard to build a company that way. It's why you're seeing some of the junior companies not able to get out of their, um, call it just, stuck in the sand sort of movement. Um, when you have wells like this, when you can drill wells like this, um, not saying the wells are gonna come on at 300 barrels per day, but you get that stable decline on it uh, for the first couple of years. After that, 
it falls off. This well in particular looks like had no water injection. So it just had its natural reservoir drive. And because the water rate fell off, as the oil rate fell off, that's giving you an indication that the, the reservoir lost pressure. It's not that the oil wasn't there anymore. It's that there's, there's no drive mechanism left that's strong enough to pull this oil um, 800 meters up from down into the surface. So again, one of the wells that could possibly be, possibly be a uh, enhanced oil recovery candidate. This one went down in 2018 uh, and it went down at a, at a pretty good rate. It was still producing uh, about 10, 10 to 12 barrels per day, it looks like, uh, when it went down. So candidate here uh, for a restart, we'll see uh, as time goes on. And here's some of the old legacy wells. So you can see producing at five barrels per day, just, just producing at that same rate for years and years and years. Uh, this one also went down in 2018. It was brought back at about that five barrels per day, um, up and down production. So for anybody, and I'll, I'll discuss this as the session goes on, but for anybody worried that, hey, the month to month production is just going up and down 10% or 15%, uh, it's it's pretty normal with these wells to have this, this kind of, um, uh, this kind of pattern. There is a downhole reason for it that you could have slugs of oil that are coming in uh, with the water. You could have uh, some changes that are being made in the water injection that affects when those slugs of oil come up, uh, uh, come out. Um, you could have changes in the way that the reservoir itself is bringing the fluids up uh, from the reservoir. And then you have a surface reason for this, which is that some of these wells are single well batteries. What it means is you have a tank on site that just produces, you produce all your fluids into this. Uh, hopefully you're separating the water before and pumping it out into the disposal. And then you have an oil tank on site. It doesn't go to a battery and then get commingled. It goes to just that site itself. So let's say you're producing four barrels per day. Well, that's, that's only about 120 barrels uh, a month. And one truckload of oil that you're, uh, uh, putting out to sales is about somewhere between 180 to 250 barrels. So depending on the truck that you have, whether you have a tri-tri or a super B, um, you'd be pumping out something like 180 to 250 barrels a month. Well, there could be certain months where you don't ship any loads. There could be certain months where you end up, because, because your tank filled up at a certain point in the month, you could have sent out two loads. Um, there could be times where you're doing some sort of sand clean out in your tank and therefore, with the sand, you pump, you 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 pushed out a bunch of oil that then goes to sales. So because of the low production into a single well battery, you have this this jagged production up and down, depending on what what gets shipped out of the uh, the tank in a certain month, and depending on how the operator is is putting that into the system. So I will let you in on a little secret um, of the oil industry. Every single company out there who, in my opinion, is operating wells properly, uh, carries what we call gravy oil. So let's say I have 50 barrels in a tank on site in a single well battery. I will put in my production accounting system that I only have 20 barrels in there. I will leave 30 barrels of what we call gravy. And what that is for is, let's say the well goes down for some reason and I lose three barrels of production. Well, I, I don't have to tell anybody I lost three barrels of production. I just keep my production rate same in the, in the production accounting system. And I take three barrels out of my 30 barrels of gravy and show that I had full runtime for the entire month. And these things can be such that you can play games with these things. So let's say there's a month where you your production is looking really bad on your other wells. Let's say you had a big well that went down. What do you do? You take 20 barrels from this well and you say, okay, this all went to sales and therefore my overall battery production looks good. So there's a lot of, call it buttering up of the numbers that goes on in, in these sorts of older wells. Uh, everybody carries extra production and that also adds to this jaggedness of production. Um, nobody will own up to this, but this is what happens on a field level. Um, and it makes a lot of sense because you don't want to be putting every single problem um, in into every single production accounting system. It's just a waste of time and it doesn't lead you to any sort of conclusion anyway. The electricity on site could have gone down. You could have a, a well that ran out of oil in the engine or just some, some dumb random thing uh, that you don't want to account for. 
and therefore you have this pattern. So with that, um, okay, hang on. There's a couple of questions here. So, uh, so if we're now drilling horizontals, is it conceivable to get to 300 uh, barrels per day? So, in my opinion, the answer is no. The reason being that a all, all the fields that are being drilled by Prospera have already been drilled with verticals. So because you've drilled with verticals, you've done two things. You've taken some of the pressure support out of the system, the entire reservoir system. And the second thing is you've drilled on the tops of the reservoirs. So when you have a reservoir, it's, it's not like a, like a tiramisu exactly flat. That reservoir goes up and down. It, there's certain places where the net pay uh, thickens. There's certain places where the net pay completely pinches out. Um, it's, it's not a clean reservoir like what they show on the diagrams. So when a company first drills into a, call it a virgin land, what they will do is drill on the tops of the reservoirs. So think about a hill uh, in the prairies. You have this hill and then you have the oil has gone all the way to the top of the hill, obviously underneath the surface. Where do you want to drill? You want to drill right in the top of that hill because all your aquifer is going to push up into that hill and you get all this oil right off the bat. That's why these wells produce so nice, these, these older vertical wells, and they produce at that, at that rate for so long because they were taking advantage of geological uh, and reservoir characteristics. Now that those have been drilled, you're now getting into the meat of the reservoir. And even though you're going with the horizontal, which has way more reservoir contact, um, you're now drilling closer to where the oil water contact is. Uh, and also you don't have this big juicy pay uh, to get into. Can they find some more as they as they go and do this drilling? Sure. You know, not, not every vertical well has drilled into the uh, 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 exact top of everything. Uh, what I mean by that is you might've drilled your 10 highest points, but you might have another 10 points that are not as high on that hill, but just a little bit lower, yet are still not in the exact flat portion um, of your reservoir. So uh, keeping an eye out on this, I, I don't want to make any conclusions because I don't have the seismic studies. I haven't done the well logging analysis to really figure out how the shape of the um, aquifer, uh, the aquifer and the reservoir is but I'm sure the company itself has done all that work. Um, so we'll sort of let that play out. And then, um, yeah, so so it is obviously possible because you have a lot more reservoir contact than the verticals did. Um, but I want, I need more information. We need to see what these first uh, four, five, six wells come out at. And then we can have a better idea of what the rest of the field will look like. And then what the other two fields that Prospera owns uh, will look like. Um, okay, so as a possible EOR candidate, what sort of typical production increase would you expect to see? Um, so I'll show you adjacent fields and how they reacted, and I'll let you figure out what number you think we can get to. Uh, keep in mind that when we run polymer floods or nanos or any sort of other tertiary recovery, we don't do the entire field at once. You you do a pilot project in in a quarter section or one section, then you go and expand it slowly into the rest of the field. So when you're asking what sort of typical production increase would you see uh, on an overall field level, you, you wouldn't see the increase from the entire field right away. You would see it from a portion of the field. And then if it's successful and economic, you then go and, and move it to a different phase two, phase three, phase four, uh, and put it across your reservoir. So um, what kind of increase can we see? I'll, I'll show you examples here. Um, as we go on as to where we are. So here's the first example. Uh, well, hang on. So the drilling plan itself. So there's eight wells, obviously, in the Brooks area, which I'll discuss later. And then there's 10 wells that are being drilled in the uh, heavy oil area. The development plan calls for, calls for 17 wells. So not all of them will be drilled right away. And not all of them are producers. Some of the wells are going to be horizontal injectors so that we can pressure support the formation. Uh, and we can also uh, obviously push the oil uh, with these injectors. So uh, just keep that in mind. You can see here which wells are being drilled um, right off the bat. Uh, we see some new injectors. The green is your uh, oil producers. And then your green dots are your existing vertical wells. So we're trying to go between the vertical wells and essentially sweep the area uh, in there and then also some of the bank oil ends up in there. Bank oil meaning you have a water flood, 
it's pushing oil, it's pushing oil, but then it finds an easier route somewhere. So once it finds that easier route, you have this area which is very, very highly oil saturated just staying there. And you can't do anything about it because your water is always going to find the path of least resistance. So what do you do? You drill right into the oil bank and then you push water into the oil bank. So now that you have a, call it a low pressure spot within your oil bank, it's possible the water will slowly start channeling into that spot, pushing the oil along with it. And that seems to be the strategy here right off the bat. Um, they want to drill between the vertical wells and depending on what the rates of the vertical wells end up at, they may end up abandoning the vertical wells. If if your if your vertical well was producing five barrels and then you drilled a horizontal and now the well went down to two barrels, well, you might say, you know what? It's it's better for my operating cost. It's better for my overall efficiency of the field to just abandon the vertical well and produce it from straight horizontals. Again, we don't know the answer. This is what is typically done in these sorts of fields. Um, yeah, so there's no polymer right now. It's gonna be straight up water flooding. Um, you don't necessarily need to go to polymer right away. Uh, water flooding works really well uh, in some of these old, uh, older legacy fields. And then um, you can move to the polymer once once we have uh, some, some water breakthrough and some channeling and coning going on. Uh, although I believe the polymer pilot is also going, uh, going to be not that far away. Um, keep in mind that this stuff is relatively cheap to try out. We're not talking about a $10, $15 million Monty well. We're not talking about a $15 million Permian well. We're talking, you can, you can set up a polymer skid in a small part of your field. You can put injection pump there and you can start pumping away for half a million bucks maybe and try it out. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. If it works, now your your reward on that is possibly five, 10, 20 million barrels of extra reser uh, reserves and extra uh, oil you can produce. So the risk reward on it is just so asymmetrically skewed um, that that you should be trying out some of these if that capital comes in. And I think I'm, I'm very happy to support uh, any sort of enhanced oil recovery project on a pilot scale um, in a part of these reservoirs. Heavy oil is where these work really, really well. Um, polymers don't really make make a difference in light oil. They don't make a difference on your frac wells. This 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 really high uh, viscosity, low API oil uh, is where it really matters. Here on the left, we have the uh, reservoir characteristics. So the original oil in place, uh, 13 million barrels. We have the uh, total produced thus far is 1.4 million barrels for a recovery factor of 11%. So we, we should be able to get to uh, 15 to 20% with the water flood. We should be able to get to 30% with polymer flood. That's the rough number of what the adjacent fields uh, that are successful with, uh, with polymer flood uh, are aiming to get to. That's roughly the numbers that as a, as a engineer slash geologist slash management, whatever um, you run with until you have the exact uh, characteristics of the field um, and you run the pilots and can figure out what the actual reserves um, you can produce are. We see the net pay and porosity, six meters net pay, really good. Porosity, anything over 30% in heavy oil uh, is considered to be top quality reservoir, doing good. And the permeability, three Darcy's. This, this rock is a really good rock. It's going to respond really well to your water floods. It's going to respond really well to your polymer floods. And also the higher your permeability is, the better the horizontals uh, make more sense as long as you can prevent the water from channeling and coning into your well. So the fact that they're thinking about drilling water uh, water injection wells as well makes me think they have a pretty good idea that the water is not going to naturally come in and channel and cone uh, into the reservoir. And Three Darcy Rock, we're talking the only place in the world or, well, in North America that have this are some of your very, very prolific conventional reservoirs and then your Gulf of Mexico offshore. Everything else is going to be sub one Darcy. Uh, a lot of heavy oil rock is going to be 200 to 500 milli Darcy. So about a order of magnitude lower permeability uh, than what this reservoir is. It's why I'm very excited to see what happens with, with, with this drilling program here. If this was a much tighter rock, you're really playing with the fire on, on some of the economics on what you're doing. 
that doesn't mean it's not economic. There's there's fields like, for example, the Chauvin field uh, in in Alberta producing seven eight thousand barrels per day um, from a from a two hundred to five hundred milliliter C permeability area. You can you can do it. Um, keep in mind, uh, Tyne Energy paid three hundred million dollars for about six thousand barrels coming out of that Chauvin field. You can do the math on on what the per flowing barrel is um, on that. So here's one of the examples that I want to share of something that has a very similar production profile. You see older vertical wells. You see water injection wells. This, this arrow symbol is your water injection. The black dot is your oil well. This black dot with the line between it is your suspended wells. And then you have some horizontals we see. So there's some uh, horizontal wells as well. And then look at here on the bottom left what's going on. We're now drilling longer horizontal wells in between your vertical wells and, and the smaller horizontals. So this is a nice field to look at because we have everything. We have all, all the things we need. And lo and behold, uh, this, this field, I believe, also has polymer flooding going on. So this is the Cactus Lake field, um, a very, very prolific polymer field um, that Kona used to own. And then obviously Kona merged into Strathcona and now soon to be the public Strathcona. Here's the oil, the oil rates. We have a huge increase. Your vertical wells in 1980s, 4,000 barrels per day. We have further increase with the water injection starting to 6,000 barrels per day. Look at the well count on top here. We're not drilling huge amounts of wells per year. It's low decline oil with enhanced oil recovery. You don't need to drill a bazillion wells to keep your production relatively at a good good pace. You know, you might look at this and say, oh, this, this thing declined 50%. Well, the 50% decline was over eight years. That's not a bad decline. That's a 5% per year, a compounded decline, not, not a big deal at all. Um, so relatively nice profile, relatively cheap to operate. And then in 2011, the polymer flood starts. And you can see for the question that was asked earlier, what can the polymer flood do? 3,000 to 9,000 barrels in about five years, five, six years, as they added the phases one by one by one. And then not, not too much drilling going on since then. Yeah, a few wells got added here and there, and we're coming down a little bit. Obviously, any enhanced oil recovery has a gains right off the bat. So you're, you're collecting the bank oil, you're collecting the easy oil, you're going to have a higher impact of your enhanced oil recovery right off the bat compared to as it goes on and on. So it's expected that the decline will be a little bit more once your polymer or your water flood is at full capacity. But you can see the chart is here right for you. This is a 40 years of history as to what happened. Here you can see the water rate. So if I just go here, the uh, this this yellow line is your water injection. As the water injection ramped up, you had your water production ramp up and you had your oil production do relatively better. That's it, simple as that. You need to have the water processing capacity. That's the only thing that matters. 7,000 barrels of oil, 130,000 barrels of water. Sounds like you can make a big deal of this and say, oh, this, this is a absolute trash. This is a water uh, a producing company, blah, blah, blah. Sure, I'll, I'll produce my 7,000 barrels all day long, no problem. So uh, just keep that in mind with heavy oil, you usually get water production and water is your friend in this case uh, because it's adding the, the, the reservoir support. It's adding the pressure support. It's pushing the oil um, into where it needs to go. There's also a gas line here. Um, don't really think it means much, but I just put it in there um, so you can see. And then the green here is your polymer injection. So as the polymer injection started in 2013, um, whoops we saw the oil production also ramp up. Going into the polymer injection, we saw all these new drills. So they drilled the reservoir. These wells right here are your 2013, 2012 to 2013 drills, these horizontals. An even better analogy to what's just about to happen on the Prospera field. So these horizontals between your verticals and whatnot, this was a 2013, a 2012, 2013 drills, and then we saw the production ramp from that. And then as the polymer flood hit, we saw even better production response from them uh, with, with very little drilling, as you can see, 
during this part of the production growth cycle. Um, the other point I want to make here is once they did this part of the of the formation, they've actually now went back to starting to drill these small stubby horizontals. So what exactly is the learnings they they understood? I, I don't entirely know, uh, but I'm thinking that they're going to go with these smaller horizontals first, do the water flooding and, and small polymer floods, and then they'll come back and drill these longer horizontals between these shorter horizontals at a future point in time uh, to take advantage of all the maximum uh, expected ultimate recovery that they can do. You, you don't just want to go and bash the thing in with, with horizontals, plus infills, plus water, plus polymer, because you're gonna leave these gaps in the reservoir uh, where you you haven't fully produced what you had to produce. Um, you know, it's like it's like if you're a basketball player, you don't just want to go straight to the NBA and start playing. You want to first compete with the people that are in your skill set, and then move to the NCAA, and then go to the to where you really know what you're doing uh, and can get the maximum benefit um, of your skill set. And then here's the map again. Um, once you see the production here. Um, okay, so a few questions. Um, yeah, so what kind of wells are counted under wells? So all three, everything is counted under the wells that is active. So when you see these graphs that I share from Petro Ninja, and it shows you the well counts on top, this is the active well counts. So any well that is suspended or uh, abandoned gets removed, any well that's a producer or an injector stays in here uh, as an active well. So when you see this line go down slightly, that's telling you, okay, some wells have gone down um, and they haven't been repaired. So, you know, it's it's not surprising that that happened in the 2014, 2015 timeframe. So uh, when people have the money, they repair the wells. When they don't have the money, the wells stay down. Kona, obviously a very, very successful company. They had the money to go and continue on with the polymer flood and the drilling even in the low times other companies like prospira and the uh company that prospira was before uh, that owned these assets they didn't have the money or they didn't want to deal with the technical challenges at the time therefore they let the properties go uh one more example on the polymer flood so we have Baytex um, that bought this property from murphy oil this is in the seal area in the blue sky uh, region or the blue sky formation. Uh, this began development in 2001. They just had horizontal well bores and then they did a polymer injection in 2010, uh, ran a pilot and then a phase one, two, three. And then they uh, sold the assets to Baytex in 2017. Baytex just kept them uh, under their, their uh, arm. And then in uh, late 2019, early 2020, they plan to expand the polymer flood. We all know what happened in early 2020. So something that we're still watching here as it goes on. Why do I like this project and why am I sharing it? Because here's the link. You can read a 40 to 60 page PDF on the geology, the mapping, the kinds of polymers used, the uh, different types of approvals required, the why did they test out certain phases, the um, productivity of each of the phases, what mistakes did they make, what were the learnings. You can read everything on here and Again, this is why Alberta is such a great province to do business in, Alberta and Saskatchewan, because so much of the information is public, it's shared, and it's out there. Again, this is one of those files that is, I believe, very, very little downloaded, uh, despite it being such a great resource. And here is what they tell you. So the pilot, they had about 7 million barrels of oil in place. The original recovery, the primary recovery was only 4%. The secondary recovery got them up to 13%. So it more than 3 x the recovery factor. The current recovery was 17% and the ultimate recovery is 25%. So it's 6 x what they were gonna get on primary recovery. Now, keep in mind the Prospera pools are not only under primary recovery. Some of them do have water floods. So there is some secondary aspect to it. But once again, you can see the difference in what happened from primary to water flood to to up uh, to polymer flood. Same thing with the phase one and phase two. We saw dramatic changes in what happened uh, from the primary to the water flood and then to the uh, polymer flood after that. And they even tell you in phase one and phase two, 
poor well placement has resulted in significantly lower recovery than what would be achievable. It happens. You you go, you do a you do a pilot, it works really well. And then you go and try and put it on a full scale and you make mistakes on your well length. You make mistakes on the distance between the wells. You make other mistakes on the uh, exact location and the orientation of the wells. So it's a learning process. Again, that's why we don't go and jam our entire field with polymer right off the bat. We want to figure out what the optimal manner is for that particular reservoir characteristics. And then we go and we uh, implement that across the field. This has been the same uh, since oil was first discovered. We we don't want to go and spend millions of dollars and then say, oh, whoops, we actually shouldn't have drilled the wells this way, or we should have drilled them shorter, or you know whatever else that mistake was made. And then here's some of Prospera's well tests, along with a data of the cleaned oil. And on the bottom here is a comparison to the Baytex seal field. Depth, about the same. Uh, 625 for the seal field, Prospera's wells are in the seven to 800 meters deep range. Net pay, we talked about how it's six meters, right within the zone. Porosity is actually higher than what um, Baytex had on their seal property. Permeability is higher than what Baytex had on the seal property. Reservoir temp, we don't entirely know. Uh, water saturation, we don't, we don't know using this data. Um, and then oil viscosity, here is the interesting part. Uh, the oil viscosity was 5,000 to 30,000. Um, in this case, dead oil. So very low flow characteristics. We see very similar in what Prospera's fields have. They are very technically challenging fields due to the nature of the oil. It is a very heavy, very dense oil. We see here 982 uh, kilograms per meter cubed, almost the same density as water. Uh, to compare, a Montney light oil is in the 725 to 750 kilograms per meter cubed, and your regular heavier oil will be in the 900 to 920 range. So very heavy, technically challenging. Nobody wanted to spend the money. Uh, when oil prices were lower, they ended up in Prospera's lap. Now oil prices are obviously uh, going a lot higher or are already higher, I should say. Um, what is the plan to get the cash flow to finance this? Will there be an opportunity to get in on an equity raise? Um, so the cash flow plan to finance the 18 drills is is uh, was discussed in detail in the podcast with uh, Bill Powers that's on Mining Stock Edu on YouTube. You can check it out. Um, I also have confirmed with management that all 18 wells are the the drilling plan, the services, and the lease pads for all 18 wells is already done. So the money has been spent on that. Um, I specifically asked them, is there any risk that the program can get stopped midway because you run out of money? And they're saying everything is already prepared. The services have been prepared. The lease has been prepared and the drilling plan has been prepared for all 18 wells. That to me is giving me confidence that they are going to continue as usual. Uh, of course, nothing is certain in the oil industry. I'm just sharing with you my understanding uh, of where we're at. Uh, no, they, they, they shouldn't need any money to finance the polymer flood. It's a relatively cheap pilot. And, um, with the 18 well drill program, they should have more than enough cash flow, um, at this point to finance that. Um, I'll just give you my opinion. I don't want any more equity raises. So, uh, we don't want any more dilution. We don't want any more money raised. Uh, if there is money required, uh, the debt financing, uh, that they did here a few months ago, I think is the way to go. And then also, um, I just think that they should just wait. If they got to wait two months to raise X amount of money and then do the polymer flood, that's fine. We don't want more dilution, uh, both because A, it's more dilution to begin with, and B, uh, it's not good optics for the for the company moving forward. They've had to raise a lot of money. They've had to do a lot of dilution and convertible debentures in order to get outside when they were being buried alive. So now that they, they're poking their head above the ground, we want to... We don't want to go and invite uh, uh, people to come stomp on the flower. We need this thing to let it let it run a little bit, get some water naturally and grow. And then we can see what we need to do um, after the fact. Um, okay, have the regulators already given pod reserve values to the horizontal drills? So some reserve value has been given. 
but not all the reserve value has been given. I think that's a very prudent decision that's being made. Um, you know, as much as people trust reserves, I, I just have no, no real care for reserves in a company like this. Uh, when you have so much untapped potential, you have so many undrilled locations, I think you have to do your own reserve evaluation. You know, some people are going to laugh and say, you know, who do you think you are thinking that you can compete with the reserve uh, auditors and, you know, go ahead, say whatever you want. The reality is you have to make your own interpretation. It may not be correct, but you have to make your own judgment based on the OOIP, based on where they're drilling, uh, what kind of what kind of uh, upside there is on that. Um, so, you know, that's that's just the reality of this. That's always been the reality. And then you have to put your own reserve on the water floods and the polymer floods. We don't really have information on the polymer or the nano yet. So I'd be very hesitant to go and give value to that right away. Um, the other comment I will make, when you have a junior company, why would you want to go and jack up your reserves in the first year and then show everything right off the bat? There's There's no point the market's not giving you credit on reserves anyway. The companies that have reserves are not getting valued at a fair multiple to their PDP or their 1P or their 2P. When you see that, why would you want to go and showboat on something that people aren't looking at? So you slowly increase it over time. When the market comes around and gives you value for it, now you go to the auditors and say, hey, look, we actually did this, this, and this that we never told you about uh, two years ago. So not saying that we we... Uh, hid it from you. We just, we didn't want to give it any value. So we just left it outside the uh, areas that we were going to go and get the reports for. So, you know, now we went in and we did the six workovers that were very, very good for us. Or we went and drilled these wells that now we want to show in the reserve, the reserve report uh, for next year. Uh, what is the reserve value you're expecting from this drilling program? So, um, I don't, I don't really know. I don't, I don't have a number that I have in mind for the reserve value. Um, I'll be completely honest with you. I'm more so looking at the production number. What the production number gets up to is what the cash flow is going to come out of the company is going to let them do more projects. It's going to let them possibly go and do the acquisitions they want to do. And it's going to allow them to just get rid of the debt, get rid of the liabilities, uh, be in a better cash position moving forward. So I would say that is how I look at it. Um, as far as uh, reserves go, I think you can just look at what you think the well is going to come on at, put a decline on it, and then put a DCF model and multiply that by 10 for the heavy oil, multiply that by eight for the, the light oil wells. And, and that would essentially be your reserve for those wells. What they get for the adjacent wells, it'll, it'll kind of be up to management how much they want to go and, and juice this up. Um, and when I say juice this up, you can kind of go both ways. You can you can be realistic on your reserves. You can go and overdo the reserves or you can undercut the reserves. So um, it just depends where they want to be um, in that. Um, okay, so Prospera has been cash flow negative. Will the next quarter be the turnaround? Uh, well, we'll find out. I, I I think the cash flow again doesn't really bother me. I'm, I'm looking for the story, the vision of what the company is wanting to do, right? When, when you have a... Um, you know, let's say your kid is six years old and he's outgrowing, growing very, very fast and getting super tall. Uh, do you go and say, uh, uh, do you go to the NBA scouts and say, Hey man, you should come and have a look. No, right. You, you see the vision of where things are headed. You go and put money into the thing. You go and put food into the thing and then you slowly build it out over time. So I think the cash flow again, uh, to me is not really that important. It's the production number that we're at in the next three months. That that to me is going to be uh, what really matters. So, and I don't want to be rude about this. So I'll, so I'll just give you the example. If the cash flow next quarter is positive 2 million versus negative 2 million. Okay, that's example one. The example two is the production next quarter is 2,500 BOEs or it's 400 BOEs, right? Which, which one is going to provide more uh, value to the investor? Which one is going to provide more um, information as to where the story is headed, right? It's a production number that really tells you uh, what's what's the um, future potential of the company and what they're doing. So um, I know I'm kind of avoiding the question on saying what the reserve is or the cash flow is uh, because I haven't run the calculation. I, I really don't 
find it interesting. Um, I think the production number tells you many things about where the company's headed, what kind of cash flow they will create in the future. And then also if the production is looking really good, that tells you the future wells are going to be quite good. If the production is looking bad, well, then the story kind of has lost, lost its meaning in that sense, right? Because the story entirely revolves around how much more oil can we produce out of these low recovery factor, high uh, original oil in place reservoirs. That That is the base level story. To get that story to work, you need to drill good wells and produce more and more of the recovery factor. So that's how I see it. Um, so before I continue, just a quick reminder, uh, we're about an hour into this. So anybody that's on the Zo um, Twitter space, you would like to join for the Zoom, whitetundra.ca, scroll to the bottom under events um, and you can join us. If not, uh, you can continue to listen in on the uh, audio as well. So here's another thing I wanted to share. So there was kind of this discussion that, hey, you know, management just raised money and they did nothing with it. They they just sat there and, you know, twiddled their thumbs. They put money into their pocket and they're just they're just chilling on the beach. Um, so here's here's some of the information that you can see as to what was done. So here is a three well pad. All the wells were suspended by 2008. So, so three well pad. All three wells have not produced since since 2008. Just sitting there doing nothing. And they came in, when Prospera came in with the new management, they came in, they worked with the Saskatchewan's version of the AER, and they did some site inspections. They fixed up some of the accrued uh, deficiencies. They went and saw, okay, what exactly do we need to do here to get our rating up, to get into the good books of our farmers in the area, to get into the good books of the service providers slowly. Nothing happens overnight. You 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 need to do things one by one, prioritize things and get them done. So one of the things that was identified was that there was a leak around one of the berm in this in this suspended well site. Okay, now you say, well, what a waste of money. This this is not adding to production. It's not doing anything. It's just capex going through through the uh, um, the 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 cash flow statement. It's uh, just a wasted money, and uh, you know we don't need to do this. Well. They do need to do this. So if they want to be in the good books, they got to fix issues that weren't their issues. They they didn't cause this problem. It just happened in these wells that were suspended for so long that that something started leaking, uh, whether it was a nipple or a valve or a fitting, something was leaking, and um, they they paid to collect two so, uh, soil samples. They went in and they did the testing on it. You can see here on the bottom the testing results. So two samples were taken. And then you have the criteria that those samples had to meet. Well, the soil met all, all the criteria. So um, even though the berm had been compromised, the soil around the berm was still up to code. It was still up to criteria. They did this uh, test. They, they got the full uh, report. They sent it to the uh, regulatory body. And the regulatory body said, OK, you this deficiency has been cleared. Fix up the berm. And we are good to go on this site. Well, bam. These are the things you need to do as a company that is trying to get out of the hole. The regulatory body will not let you drill wells if you got all these deficiencies, you got unattended to issues that they've written you up for, you've got oil uh, sheens and leaks all over the place. They're not gonna let you drill. They might not even let you reactivate certain wells. So before we got to the real cash flow production torque, there's some other issues that had to be fixed which is why the operating cost has been higher and which is why the CapEx has been a little bit higher um, because some of it was going to non-production activities. And because they fixed all of this, because they got their liability ratio over one, now they can go and drill wells, which is exactly what they're doing. So it's a process. It's it's all a process. This is, this is you know, I've said this many, many times before. This is not a video game where you, you, you go from zero to 100 in, you know, a six hour session of playing uh, playing that game. This this happens day to day to day to day. It's a very slow going process. Um, and they're working on these things, but these things get ignored, right? People go in there, they spend five minutes reading a balance sheet. They spend five minutes reading an, an MDNA and then all of a sudden their head blows up and, and they start shouting and yelling and screaming about negative cash flow and the production is this and, you know, wh where's all this money going, blah, blah, blah. So just 
calm down, relax, check out what's happening, look at stuff that isn't being mentioned in the MDNA, look at the wells, what the well status is, look at the liability ratios, look at the asset retirement, retirement obligations, look at how many deficiencies they have with the regulatory bodies, see what they're doing that's not directly related to production or cash flow. This is especially important in junior companies. It's especially important in restructuring stories. There, there's a reason they ended up as restructuring stories. Uh, it wasn't because things were going uh, kosher and everything was going well. There was something that went wrong, majorly wrong, that now the new management team has to fix, even if it's not their fault. It, it, it doesn't matter. You have to fix it before you can continue. Um, okay. So that's that's one that I want to share. Uh, for those that have ac that have access to Petra Ninja, you can go through the wells, go under documents, and you can read a lot of these reports. So not not just for Prospera, other well wells, other companies, you can see some of the activities that are being done um, that is not related to the actual production of the well. Um, the rest, I mean, you can get the information other places as well uh, by just contacting the, the regulatory body or going through their online databases and seeing what kind of deficiencies do they have, what kind of ongoing incidents are they dealing with, et cetera, et cetera. So one more polymer flood. I have discussed this one in the past as well. This is the uh, Baytex Laporte asset. Uh, they acquired this from Raging River, which themselves acquired it from Brock Energy uh, a few years ago. It is this pool right here. And for those that have a keen eye, this is where Prospera is drilling. So we're talking about 12 miles away uh, is where this polymer uh, uh, field is and it's and it's being implemented as we speak. Here is the wells. So green again is your oil. Your light green is your polymer injection. You can see the first phase of the polymer injection didn't, didn't really do much. It, the wells were still declining very fast. Some of the wells were falling away. And then as they restarted the polymer injection in late 2022, you can see production has almost doubled from 400 barrels to about 700 barrels uh, in that meantime. And look at the well count. It's the same. They, they haven't done any drilling. In fact, they've lost wells uh, in the last 12 months from probably just from stuff going down um, that they haven't bothered to fix at this point in time. Baytex obviously has many, many places they can deploy capital. So they have to prioritize things um, accordingly. But you can see the the very, very quick response of the polymer that that was had. And it's the same zone. It's the same formation. It's, it's, it's the same characteristics um, 12 miles away. These all, all these four fields are the exact same. The, the Marengo, the Monterio North, East and South, and then the Baytex Laporte. And you can see here, there's a private company doing some new drilling, uh, trying to figure out uh, uh, if they can hit another pool um, in the area. So all of this in close vicinity, you can go and look at all these wells. This is the only one that is currently under Palmer flood. These three, I believe, are owned by CNRL. And then this one on the eastern side is owned by a company called Enhanced Energy, which are uh, CO2 experts, CO2 injection experts, and uh, kind of finding pools that are mismanaged or underproduced. So it's not just Prospera that has these pools um, that's trying to go and chase this oil in the ground. There's just other companies. They may not have the same kinds of pools or they may not have the same quantity of pools, but there is other people doing this. This is not some guy out there decided he's going to be, you know, some some hotshot and do something that, 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 that no one else has done before. Other companies are trying to do the same thing. The easiest place to find oil is where the oil's already been discovered. So why why try and reinvent the wheel here? Uh, if it's already there. So you can see here the different pools. You can see here the different oil pays um, and and the fact that Prospera asset is within this range. You can see the porosity, 32% again for this field here that Prospera has. The OOIP remaining. So you can see Prospera's fields are relatively the new uh, newer part of their life. This Monterio South pool has recovered 55% of oil already with no polymer flood. These other pools have recovered somewhere between 15 and 40% of the oil with no polymer flood, as far as I'm, I'm aware. The Laporte pool has only has only recovered 6% of the oil and is already on polymer flood. So you can see here, this field has a long ways to go, a lot more oil to produce. 
and you can see the oil cuts once again. When you get to these 10, 15, 20, 30 percent recovery factors, your oil cut is going to be one to two percent. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with this. I see so much discussion around water production and water cuts, and uh, uh, there's something wrong with this reservoir because it's producing all this water. Uh, there's there's nothing wrong with it. It's just nature has made oil less dense than water. So oil floats on water. Therefore, the wells, most wells always come on with a stronger oil cut. As the wells get older, the oil oil cut goes down. As you put water floods, the oil cut goes down. It's, it's simple grade one logic. Um, so I guess I'll just leave it at that. I have no problem. As long as you're producing oil, keep producing all the water you want. Completely irrelevant because 99.9% .9 of it is recycled water. It's the same water you're injecting in the ground. That's just recycling and sweeping oil uh, on every pass through. So good. Um, okay, so there's a question here. Is polymer technology relatively homogenous or is it diversity of recipes? So, so a, a lot of diversity. You have to pick the right polymer for your kind of rock, for your kind of permeability, the porosity, the different kinds of clays in the ground, the different kind of sandstone you have in the ground, the kinds of water saturation, the dissolved solids in the water, um, all, all sorts of production rates that you inject at, depending on what we want to see. So this is not something that, you know, I'm just going to go to Walmart, pick up a polymer bottle and start injecting it down the ground. There's 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 a significant work uh, that goes into it. And the first pilot doesn't always work perfectly. We saw this happen with hemisphere energy, where they were starting to inject the polymer and then they ended up creating asphaltines and wax in the reservoir that was plugging up the, the, the permeability channels. So they went in, made a little bit of an adjustment and boom, bam. A, now we see that hemisphere is getting much better results from their polymer because of the, they've gone through this. So no need to panic if if there's some uh, issues from this. This is not a video game. There is going to be things that are not coded. It's going to be unknown things that come up um, because the the reality is there's nobody in this world who can see 800 meters through the earth underground. If there is, you you can make a trillion dollars. Uh, figuring out polymer floods and water floods uh, and drilling wells. So um, that opportunity still exists for anybody uh, who has that skill set. So, uh, okay, so there's another question here. Uh, are some companies getting a lot better at this or getting it right the first time? Um, there is, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. As more polymer floods get implemented, naturally you're going to see a better success rate. You're going to see more different kinds of secret sauces being discovered. Um, you're going to get different variations that are discovered, the different injection rates. That being said, there's inherently risk in all of this. Nothing is 100%. Um, I, I have seen different trials um, in various parts of Canada now, and I would say very few of them are working on the first time around. That's, that's why they run a pilot and kind of see what's working. And keep in mind, just because something is working, doesn't mean it's the best it's the best recipe for that for that reservoir. You could have used something else which would have been 50% better, right? So it's it's always worth not just going to the first polymer and just sticking with it because it works. You you want to try out different ones um the same way that we want to try out different water injection rates and different types of uh, drilling and completions and you know uh infill spacing uh perfs etc. And then uh, we see here you have your oil, regular production, water flood. You can see how the water has channeled. You have your polymer flood where you've, you've, you've gone and got more of the oil. You're able to access some of these trapped oil. And then you've, you have your nano flood. So what the nano does, essentially, you can see here in this diagram, when the oil really wants to stick to the rock, it'll go in with these nanoparticles and push the oil off the rock. Once that oil is slightly showing its its little opening, now now the polymer or water can get underneath it like a chisel and push it up over time. So very, very new technology. I don't want to go and say that nano is going to work on this reservoir or or any such thing. It's out there. Companies are using it. It is a new technology. It works really good for heavy oil. the The beauty of all of this is 
heavy oil never got the, the right kinds of optimization and efficiency that the fracks did, that the drilling did, that the uh, uh, unconventional plays did, that some of the uh, bigger oil sands plays did. Heavy oil was just too expensive. Nobody wanted to go and spend the money on something that barely generated a net back at $50 to $60 oil. So they just left it. Now that we have $80 oil, now companies are saying, you know what, hang on a sec. There's a lot of oil in these reservoirs. We can get to really high recovery factors. We have a lot of technological upside and we have a lot of enhanced oil recovery upside. Why don't we go in here and uh, try and get some more oil out of these reservoirs? It's, it's again, it's not very difficult conclusion to come to when the money makes it worth it to go and do this. Okay, here are the Brooks wells. So that's the, that was the heavy oil that I shared, the 10 wells. We now have the Brooks wells. So eight wells into the Pekisco formation. They're saying an IP rate of 67 barrels per day, uh, ultimate recovery of 60,000 barrels. So 67 barrels per day, they're putting in a initial decline rate of 48% per year. Okay, pretty fair. I think that's about normal for this kind of reservoir. Uh, reserve life index of about 10 years is what they're gonna produce for. Um, and then you have your, um, they, they, they already have a centralized battery. They're gonna reinject the water, low operating cost operation, we'll see. And then they've acquired the new leases and constructed them already. Now, there's two wells that were recompleted in this, in this formation um, in late 2022. Uh, they have produced at the rates that Prospera said they were. Um, there is a lot of confusion around where, where are the rates? Why aren't the wells being produced? So my understanding is that, um, oh, I don't have the graph here, unfortunately. So my understanding is that these, the, the, the wells that were recompleted, they were abandoned in the other zone about 15 years ago. So the well was produced for a few months. It was abandoned. The well was just a tiny little wellhead on site. Uh, the grass was growing around it. The wells, well site got uh, destroyed, uh, overrun by grass and whatnot, and there was no infrastructure. So there was nothing to produce the oil into. What, what are you going to do? You're going to produce it into some sort of mud pit. Um, so, so essentially what happened is that because they don't have the money for the infrastructure to build a battery, to build a water injection, to build a pipelines and the surface facilities, they just left them. They said, no, if we do this, we're taking a risk on these wells um, because they never let the wells flow long enough to figure out what rates were they going to peter out at. Uh, because of that, it just didn't make sense to build all this stuff. And then you find out the well had a relatively higher decline rate on it. So they left those two wells. They're going to wait until this other drilling program goes through, drill these eight wells. And now you have reason to go and build all this infrastructure in this part, um, what does it cost? I don't, I don't entirely know, uh, but let's just be honest. Prospera did not have the money um, for the last six or twelve months to go and drill or to go and put money into facility projects. They needed to put money into production projects, um, which is what they've done. So, okay, I'll leave that there. Um, you, you can see the reservoir characteristics here. So, the number of sections, the uh, water saturations, the porosity. Um, here and then the oil in place that you come up that you come up with with a volumetric calculation. Here are some of the Pekisco wells in other parts of Alberta. So on the top here you have Torxen, a Schlumberger company, pretty good, 140 barrels it came on at, has about that 50% decline rate, and about uh, five years later, about four years later, it's making 10 barrels. So looks like a Viking or a Montney kind of uh, production profile. Here is a well from uh, Pinecliff. So Pinecliff also very active in the Pekisco. Most people maybe don't know this, even though it's a gas company, they have been very active on the oil drilling in the Pekisco. Some really, really good wells. 400 barrels per day IP. Uh, month three or four is about 200 barrels per day. And then even one year down the road, it's producing 100 barrels per day. Pretty good. Um, for, for this kind of well, relatively cheap to drill these, um, it makes sense. And then you have a company called Islander Oil and Gas. This is in Northern Alberta. They are drilling into the Pekisco 600 barrels per day and petering out 
in about six months at 300 barrels per day. You have another welder drilled a little bit slower. Uh, production came on at 160 barrels per day and month three has gone down to 85 barrels per day. We'll continue to track this over time. Just keep one thing in mind. For Spira is saying the IP is going to be 67 barrels per day. That's it. You're seeing wells in the Pakisco not making 68 or 69 or 70 barrels per day. They're making three, four, five, 600 barrels per day. Again, we don't have the information to conclude what the Prospera wells are going to come on at. There's other wells in the Pakisco that are showing really good results. Here is the Pakisco as a whole in Alberta. The wells in the Pakisco that were drilled post-2017. So, or, or sorry, 2019. So you can see here, we're starting at zero wells in Q1 of 2019. And these wells are now producing 5,500 barrels per day out of just 30 wells. And keep in mind, this includes the wells that were drilled two, three, four years ago and have declined since then. And we're making 5,500 barrels per day out of 35 wells. This is not just one area. This is Torxon. This is the city of Medicine Hat. This is North 40 Resources, Pine Cliff, Islander Oil and Gas, and a couple of other small private companies that are included in this graph. So I'm not cherry picking the most productive Pekisco Reservoir. All Pekisco drills after 2019 are shown in this graph. For Spira is saying their wells are going to come on at 67 barrels per day. So when you're making an opinion as to what is conservative, what is realistic, and what is too optimistic, you can do the math here uh, and see what makes sense. So that's kind of the base uh, of, of what I want to share on kind of overall the new drilling program. Um, it's pretty obvious why I am bullish on the company, um, given the inherent geologic characteristics. Um, again, this is not investment advice. This is the due diligence on other adjacent properties, um, on other fields in the area. I would recommend anybody curious about the polymer flood to go and read the uh, Baytex uh, seal uh, PDF that they put out with the AER. I would go and uh, suggest people read about Strathcona Cactus Lake field. Uh, and then I would suggest people go and look at these Pekisco wells um, that Pine Cliff is drilling. They've, they've shared some information about that in their MDNAs. Uh, and then the Islander Oil and Gas is unfortunately private, uh, but you can get some information from uh, files that are out there um, on, on sort of what they're doing. So um, I'll leave it at that on the drilling program. And then we will now talk about some of the concerns about the company that have been brought up. And I think, uh, you know, re really good kudos uh, to bringing these things up because we want to go and have a clear understanding uh, of what's happening. These junior companies are not always the most transparent. They're not always the easiest to understand. There's usually an inherent risk profile to them. Um, and, and then a lot of things can be missed because you just don't have the same level of investor base looking at these companies. So when you have 20,000 people looking at the bigger companies, and only 20 people looking at the smaller companies, there's inherently just less, less minds or less eyeballs uh, trying to figure out what some of the issues could be uh, on some of these. So the first one we have here is the Prospera recapitalization. So uh, we see the shares outstanding are going up. We see the share price uh, has, has sort of gone up and then it's come down. And then the overall market cap of the company is, is relatively flat over the last uh, six months, let's say. Um, I will just, again, share that uh, we participated as the lead investor with the private placement in January. So this is when the entry point was, the corresponding market activity, and then we're seeing uh, a sort of drawdown or overall activity drift as we w uh, awaited the drilling program, which we're now into. And then here is sort of where the production profile of the company was. So the message here is saying that they have really gone nowhere production wise. Okay. So we see here at the end of 2020, well, in mid 2020, the production was about 150 barrels per day, BOEs per day. By late 2022, we were at more than 700 BOEs per day. And we currently sit at about 500, uh, well, 750 BOEs per day net. Uh, to to Prospera, this this graph only shows oil production. Uh, it doesn't show the uh, the gas production there. So you know 
the message is correct. The concern is correct that the share count has gone up. The concern is correct that the warrants have been exercised such that the market cap um, has been uh, uh, has been the same despite the share count going up. Um, yet the comment around going nowhere production wise is incorrect. So the production has been increased about three X since the low on the oil side. There's a corresponding increase on the gas side. And part of that is, is because they are doing acquisitions. So they are buying more working interest in their properties. If you want to buy more working interest in the properties while they're cheap and while you haven't put in a lot of money into it on optimizing it, you got to go and raise money and you got to go and raise the ventures uh, when maybe you don't want to. Um, so, so that's what they did. And because of that, the share counts are going up. Um, keep in mind the warrant exercise that's causing the share price, the, the share count to go up, the money is coming into the company. So 2023, they're receiving $4.2 million from warrants. 2024 and 2025, it's about uh, 2.6 to $3 million each. So as that share count is going up, the company is receiving money that they don't have to go and raise on the public markets, that they don't have to go and raise on debt, debt uh, instruments. So there's an inherent money coming into the company, uh, which I think people will say is better than them going and, and and continually raising $2 million every six months on the public markets. So for anybody that's concerned, hey, you know, they might go and do another $2 million private placement. Well, they already are. They, they The money is already coming into the company through the warrants. It, it's already been done. We don't need to go and do more and more of these things. Uh, if you already have unexercised warrants that are out there, I believe there's a large chunk of warrants that's gonna expire in November of this year which should add more money for the drilling program. And of course, add more money just into the general working capital um, of the corporation. Uh, one quick comment here. There's a lot of discussion on the CEO, which I will talk about here as, as the um, session continues, but let's just talk about the CFO for a second. So Matthew Kenna was a CFO who was brought in uh, a couple of years ago, and he's the CEO and founder of Mantle Canada. It is a pump and oil field services company. It is one of the biggest success stories that's come out of Southern Saskatchewan uh, on the oil field services side. They've gone to employing about hundred people and about $40 million in revenue on a very, very lean operation. Um, you know, this, this, most people have never heard of Mantle Canada. Well, ask anybody in the Cuthbert, Weyburn, Estevan, Macklin area about Mantle and you will hear about the success story of this corporation starting from zero and becoming this oil field services, not, not behemoth, but the choice for a lot of companies when they look at pumps, especially uh, oil field downhole pumps, I should say. Um, so why would the CEO of this successful company want to come in and be the CFO of Prospera and work for free? Why would he put, his, put himself out there? Just to make a dollar or two? Just to look good? Just to add it to his resume? No, because his LinkedIn doesn't even show that he's working at Prospera. So ask yourself, why would a successful entrepreneur go and put themselves in the line of fire of a restructuring story and not get any compensation out of it? Okay, well, maybe there's some inherent synergies. Maybe Prospera can use Mantle's pumps and therefore there's a synergy there. Well, they're already doing 40 million in revenue. Does, is Prospera really that big that that's what's going to make the company that, that important? Or is it maybe some personal uh, challenges and going out and bringing a company from the dead back into really, really good operations and people have that personal satisfaction and um, growth, internal growth, I guess, of doing that. Take it for, for what it is. This this means nothing to certain people. To, to certain people, you got to think about it logically, why a person like that would put themselves into, into the situation. And then you can say, okay, if somebody's calling the company a scam, you're essentially calling all these people that are that are part of this as they're either completely stupid or they're all scammers. Um, and I guess I'll I'll leave that up to your opinion as to uh, where we're at in this right now. But I did think that was important because I looked up every single person on the management and the C-suite and all the all the major investors and everything, and and what would be their reasoning for partaking in this in this restructuring story. Here's some of the placements that were done. 2021, money was very hard to raise in 2021, summer of 21. 
I think we all know this. There was concern that companies were going to go under. Um, there was concern that companies will not be able to refinance their debt. There was concern that there was too much debt on the balance sheets. The RBLs were going to be pulled. And yet here is Prospera raising 800000 on the placement and $3.3 million on a convertible debenture. So again, why? Why would people want to put money into this if it was a scam? Why would people want to put money into this if the value, inherent value was not there in 2021? You could have bought a debt-free company. You could have bought something with very little debt on it in 2021. You could have bought any anything on the public markets in 2021, and you would have made a ton of money, uh, especially in the oil sector. Why take the risk? $4.1 million was not easy to raise for a company in this bad of a balance sheet shape in 2021. Somebody made a bet. And if you think that that person just had 4.1 million to give away, maybe, but maybe there's something more to the story uh, when you think about it from a logical sense. Current shares here. So we have the current outstanding share count. We have the total warrants outstanding. This is about three months old. Um, and then you have the debenture conversion, which was pushed to 2025 uh, for now would be converted uh, at, a, at a future point in time um, if the entity doesn't want to be paid back on the debenture bought back as is. Uh, so total fully diluted share count, 521 million for the case of Prospera and you're running any sort of calculation on cash flow multiples or production multiples, use the fully diluted share count. That's just how it should be done in this case, but also take this money from the warrant financing and subtract that from the debt. So you can do it one of two ways. You can't you can't just add the fully diluted share count and then not account for the fact that there's money coming in with that. If you're gonna use a basic share count and not account for the warrant financing, that's completely up to you. Um, I don't think it's the accurate way to do it in this case, um, just given that some of the warrants may be way in the money by the time they're exercised in 2024 to 2026. Um, yes, none of the warrants are traded as far as I can tell. And I feel like there's no um, no interest in allowing them to trade um, given that uh, given that there's many different tranches of them. It's not just one warrant. There's some expiring in, in, in different months, in different years, uh, and they have different strikes on them as well. So uh, I don't think they're gonna be listed. How long is the drilling program expected to take? So the... Horizontal wells are about one week each. So 10 wells, 70 days, two months. We're looking at the end of October. My understanding is that the Brooks, the, the rig for the Brooks property is going to be a second rig. It's not going to be the same rig. It's going to be a second rig that fires up and then drills those in about five days each. So eight wells, five days, 40 days total, uh, about a month and 10 days. So essentially they can get started that by end of September they should be able to get the 18 wells done by the end of October, let's say mid-October for now. And then it'll take another few days to get each well into operation, do the surface uh, work, get the pipeline done, um, and then get it into operation and running. So all of it's going to happen all at the same time. One well is going to be drilled while other ones are going to be com uh, completed or perfed. Other wells are going to be uh, doing the equip and tie-in procedure and then other companies are going to be, or other wells are going to be coming onto production. Uh, I have given management a um, sort of a, a uh, template of how they should report the wells. Uh, the template was taken from Delphi Energy and the way they used to report their Montney production. So they used to have the well UWI, unique well identifier. They used to have the lateral length, the uh, zone, and then the IP30, IP60, IP90, IP120, IP180. They used to have all the transparent information there on every single well. Why can't we do the same? This is all public data anyway. And I think it's it's good to be transparent in this case and show what, what uh, they have. And I will be continually pushing that button and saying, you need to be transparent. You cannot be out here uh, saying we're gonna release results only after three months or six months. That, that cannot be the case. Uh, I think that's just, not the right way to go about it. Um, and that's where I think really gonna be pushing on a few certain topics uh, with this company to act in, in that certain manner. I don't run the company, so I'm not I'm not in here 
uh, to, to make decisions or step on people's feet. But these things are relatively easy to do. They don't cost you anything. You can go and take the same template and steal it and just put your own numbers in there uh, and move on. Um, okay, so there's another question here. Do you have a year-end production target? So I, I personally don't uh, have anything in mind. I'm running on the, they have about 750 to 800 BOEs per day right now gross. I'm going to run at the 50 barrels per day minimum on the horizontal wells. Uh, not all of them are producers as far as I understand. So we can't just multiply it by 10. Um, and then the Brooks wells are all producers. And I'm going to run with 50, 50 barrels per day on them as well. So let's say there's a total of 15 wells, 50 barrels per day, 750, 750, 1500. Anything more than that is going to be to me a uh, bonus. I, I really want to see one or two wells that are 100 barrels per day plus. So I will say this right now on the on the 10 wells, let's say there's eight wells that are oil wells on the oil program, uh, on the heavy oil program, don't expect them all to be the same production. There's going to be six wells that are at type curve. There's going to be one well that is a complete junk, five or seven barrels. And there's going to be one well that is 70, 80, 100, 150 barrels. That's, that's how these programs go. Um, if there's two wells that are really good, I'm going to be even happier. Um, and then if there's two wells that are bad, then then you really got to take everything into account as a whole. Keep in mind, these wells are not just being drilled for primary recovery. We're also looking at the water flood impact and we're also looking at the polymer impact. So the IP of the well right off the bat, it's going to produce the oil near it. As the water flood starts coming in, the water is going to push more oil into the near wellbore area. So the IP 30 is maybe not the right way to look at it. Well, if you're asking me for year end production target, we're only really going to have IP 30s. We, we want to see how that production goes as the year goes on. I just showed you other wells in the area that are much above 50 barrels per day. But for the sake of when we're, when we're looking at what we can get to, 1500 is where we are. And there's obviously upside to that. I'm, I'm usually very realistic in my well, to, well production numbers. I'm going to tell you this one is quite conservative um, just because I think the upside on some of these wells is not going to be on the IP, is going to be on the water flood coming in and then the polymer at some future point in time coming in. Um, not not all these wells are going to produce like gangbusters right off the bat. That's that's heavy oil in a nutshell for you. These are not Viking wells. These are not Montney wells. We don't really care about the IP30. We care about the IP90 and the IP365 and where we go from there. So um, if you ask me what I think Q124 or Q224 is going to be, now you'll get a very, very higher number from me because I think that's going to allow all the water flood to work the system to really readjust to the new uh, wells and the low pressure zones. And then we can really see that uh, in its full form in Q1 of 2024, let's say, uh, and go from there. One caveat, of course, Prospira has had trouble operating in the winters. So because of the wells, the way they are, the viscosity of the oil and the API of the oil, there is risk to the downside um, on the production numbers into November, December, January, February, which is why, again, I'm going to remain very conservative on my numbers uh, and, and say 1,500 barrels per day by the end of the year. Uh, I would be not, not happy, but I would be content uh, that, okay, things are progressing along um, as we need to be. Again, these wells are low decline wells. Just because they didn't come on like gangbusters doesn't mean that they're not, they're not economic wells. If it produces at 60 barrels per day or 50 barrels per day for the next five years with no decline on it. Isn't that what we want for low, low decline cash flow along with a ability to, to sell the company in the future? You want your low decline base. Um, once once the well results actually come out, I will immediately adjust those targets. So, so don't take this as a gospel that I said this today and therefore this is what it should be by the end of the year. As soon as I have information on the first well, second well, third well, and then the first Brooks well, second well, third well, I will adjust these targets uh, on a moving moving sort of target for the year end production um, on that. Okay, um, the other uh, concern that was raised here was that the company doesn't have the money to drill. Um, I mean, I don't know what to say. So basically the uh, seminar with uh, mining stock Edu, Bill Powers, 
and then uh, Kerry and the CEO Sam um, has has shared the exact funding of the drill program, and the drilling rig is on site, and it's drilling the second well. So, if you're saying they have no money to drill, maybe you might have discovered time travel and you're 15 days in the past. So, again, this is a trillion dollar project. Uh, if you've if you really dis uh, discovered time travel, um, you might be onto something here. Um, okay, so the other concern that was raised was the uh, exit rate of the company. So the exit rate last year was promised at 1,000 BOEs per day, exiting at 1,500 BOEs per day. Sorry, let me repeat. They were said that they were going to be at 1,000 BOEs per day when the conference call was made and that they were going to exit at 1,500 BOEs per day. They blamed it on the weather. The investor conference was in November, so the cold weather would have already set in. Fair, absolutely fair statement. They... I will be the first one to say they did not meet their 2022 exit rate. They did not meet their 2022 production target. Fair. So what exactly has happened? So I spoke with the individual who was on the other side of the asset that Prospera was trying to buy. Okay. This is a ENP, obviously, operating in the heavy oil area, um, may or may not have other assets. And they had a deal in place to sell some assets to Prospera. Um, the deal was made. The money was made. And again, don't, don't take this for gospel. This is what I am told and my understanding of the situation. So they had the deal made. Everything was going good. And then what happened was somebody looked at Prospera's balance sheet and they said, okay, even though these guys are saying they can give us the money, do we want to sell to a company with an LLR liability rating under one? Do we want to sell to a company with a balance sheet like this that has promissory notes, that has uh, debentures, that has all these warrants and uh, has a lot of deficiencies with the regulatory body? Do we want to sell it to them? And why did this get brought up? Because we all know the story about Sequoia and Perpetual. So Perpetual Energy, run by Sue Riddell Rose, the wife of Mike Rose, famously of Tourmaline, runs Perpetual Energy. In 2016, they sold some gas wells and facilities to a company called Sequoia. Sequoia took them. They paid very nominal amounts for them. Gas price was low. There's a lot of liabilities with the company. So Sequoia just paid some nominal amount. They took the they took the gas wells and they started producing them. Then commodity prices got even weaker. 2016, 2017, 2018, Sequoia went bankrupt. They declared bankruptcy and they just left all the assets to the Orphan Well Association. Well, what happened? The Orphan Well Association and Sequoia came back and they sued Perpetual. They said, you sold us this asset, even though you knew that our balance sheet and our cash flow and our liability rating was not good enough for you to sell us this asset. A weird way to phrase a lawsuit, but maybe they were correct. Maybe they were misled as to what they thought they were buying, um, or maybe they, they, they knew they couldn't take it on but they were still sold the asset just because of the way they went and did the negotiation. And here is the kicker on it. Sequoia bought the shares of a perpetual subsidiary that held the assets, bypassing a solvency test to gauge the financial health of companies. So there's a twist to this, that perpetual had these assets in a subsidiary that they knew would be able to pass a solvency test, despite the fact that those assets should have never been able to transact. This is my understanding. I'm not, I'm not making a judgment on who's right, who's wrong. This is an active court case. I have no interest in getting subpoenaed or involved in, in any manner. So these are the facts. And um, what ended up happening, now there's a 200 and something million dollar lawsuit that has gone on for multiple years. The lawyers have made lots of money and nothing has been resolved. So the other party to Prospera that was going to sell them the assets said, we don't want to end up like a a, a perpetual. We don't want to sell these assets to these guys that have a lot of liabilities, but also has a lot of production upside. And then two years later, Prospera goes under and then they sue us because we sold this to them. And that's why the deal got canceled. And that's the majority of the reason why Prospera's exit rate in 2022 was not met. There you go. So whether you think that's fair or not, whether you think that is a fair um, excuse or not, it's totally up to you. I, I will just say, I don't even know what assets were being transacted. 
So I, I have never figured that out. I think it would be illegal for me to know uh, from the company's perspective, telling me um, more than this. The company never even told me this. I just found out through a mutual contact um, who I was chatting with. And it may, the story may even be twisted. The, this may not be the true story, uh, but this is what was told by an individual on the other side of the, of the transaction. So what did Prospera do? Well, March, 2023, they announced this, which got completely ignored. They announced that they have addressed 400 non-compliance, they've abandoned 60 wells, and they've increased their liability rating from 0.37 to 1.2. They've erased the liability deficit of $9 million and have an asset now of 4 million as far as the NAV of the, of the assets goes. What does that let them do now that they couldn't do in Q3 and Q4 of 2022? Exactly. As, as they get more and more higher liability rating, the liability rating is gonna increase because of the new drills. The new drills are gonna add a lot of deemed asset value to the company. Your liability rating might go to 1.5, it might go to 1.75. Now you can go and take on these assets with the other party not worried about your situation. Now with the warrants money coming in, with the cash flow coming in, you're able to erase some of your debt and you're able to take on these assets a few months later. So both a blessing uh, and a curse. The curse that they weren't able to close the deal and therefore missed the whatever target they had. The blessing being they can still do it. And in the meantime, it's allowed them to really work on the existing asset they had. If they had bought this other asset, they may have only been able to drill seven wells or 10 wells. They may not have had the money to go and drill more. they Their liability rating might have not been over one, so they might have had to delay the drill program to 2024. We we don't know how it would have panned out. Nobody expected the price of oil for the first six months of 2023 to be sub $80 a barrel. Nobody expected that. So the fact that they rode out that time without all this abandonment liability on them um, and having to spend on the reclamation, whatever, we'll see how it pans out. I'm happy with the excuse, whether okay. you are or not. Um, I will sort of leave it up to you. Um, Prospera's corporate presentation includes net income of 14 million. Do you think this is realistic? Um, again, I, I have not run any of these numbers. Like you, you may find it's hard to believe that I don't I don't know or I don't care what the cash flow is or the net income is. I, I just don't. What matters right now is the 18 wells. Once those 18 wells are online and we have some sort of production number off them, now it makes sense to try and run cash flow uh, calculations, uh, your decline rate calculations, your net income, um, your reserves, and whatnot. Right now, it just doesn't matter. Um, the well results are really what's going to drive the company value. The well results are, are what's going to drive the company's uh, growth plans um, and sort of ability to produce the oil in the ground moving forward. Um, yeah, it, it it sort of is and it sort of isn't like an Enron uh, in a sense because this happens more than we think. There was another major, uh, uh, or sorry, mid-cap ENP where the, a, the AER essentially blocked a transaction from happening uh, because the company itself was just, was just not in the right balance sheet um, setup to go and buy this other asset. Um, so, so I've heard of two of these now in the last three months. And I think there's there's probably more. I I don't think I'm gonna hear about all of them, obviously. Um, so I think it happens more more than we think, especially in today's world where the abandonment liabilities uh, are getting more of a concern to certain people, and also because um, companies are just scared of this of this because there's a precedence for this Sequoia Perpetual issue um, that has happened now uh, once, I guess, in a in a major way. And it's also ongoing, by the way, with the Pirate and Shell transaction. There, there's a lot of issues there with the asset transfer and the way that's being dealt with. Uh, so, so there's two examples in a sense where there are major issues with, with transacting with an entity that's got high uh, debt and got a high ARO liability already. So just to add, uh, add to this a bit more, so the the... The concern also discusses the cold weather setting in. Um, so I think all of those that live in live in Alberta here and Saskatchewan, we know uh, cold is a relative term. 
Um, you'll see people in March out there in minus 15 in their tank tops. You'll see people who have just moved to Canada in plus 10 degrees out wearing jackets. So it's a very relative term. Uh, what happened last year was that the the winter issues really hit at a certain point in time. I don't exactly know when at this point. I don't I don't remember, uh, but I believe December and January where you're really, really cold, minus 50 degrees Celsius points. Um, does minus 50 cause a problem? No. Does minus 50 for a week cause a problem? Yes. So the wells going down had more to do than just cold weather. It has to do with the severity of the weather and the longevity of the weather. So if you if you have wells that are that are just constantly in the cold for a week straight, there is going to be problems not just on the flow line of the oil, but your engines don't like to work in minus 50. They 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 start sputtering, they start running out of fuel gas, they, the uh, engine oil starts getting thick, the hydraulic oil starts getting thick. There's just a consistent problem here. It is basic thermodynamics. When you have oil sitting inside a steel or, or some sort of container, just because it's minus 50 doesn't mean the oil inside is minus 50 right away. It takes time for that heat transfer to occur over whatever insulation and, and actual metal you have between the oil and the outdoor elements, obviously. Um, so as, as that played out over multiple days is when the company really started suffering. Um, and I can tell yeah. you this for what it matters from having done this kind of work. So this is the modern resources Wapiti Cardium field in Grand Prairie. Uh, this is when I was with Velvet Energy out in Edson. So we worked in these conditions. It's it's not hard to work in them for a few hours or a day or two or three. When it goes on for a week or 10 or 15 days, you are working 24 seven because everything is down and there's nothing you can do. You're just, you fix one thing, another thing goes down. You, you, you spend six, eight, 10 hours fixing one well. And sometimes you just say, you know what, leave it. We'll leave it until the wells are, until the weather is more pleasant, which means it went from minus 50 to minus 30 and then you go and go fix the wells. So uh, this is something that happens a lot all across Alberta. It it suffers more in the heavy oil, low API oils naturally because they're just heavier. They don't like to flow anyway and they have a lower viscosity or sorry, they have a higher viscosity um, which just doesn't let them flow uh, in the winter climate. So I think just, just saying that they said this in November uh, when the cold weather was already there, yeah, okay, that's that's a fair statement, but it doesn't it doesn't show you the true nature of how the of how the oil industry works. So severity, longevity of the cold, are what the problem is. It's the same with wildfires or the heat or or whatever problem you have. You can run a day or two very very lean, but then the things start piling up. If you have a chemical pump that's down for a day, big deal. If it's down for a week, eh, should be okay. If you're done for a month, now your entire flow line is full of wax and you got to go and do a batch job or do some sort of clean out. So everything is a is a process in this industry. Um, okay, so there's quite a few questions here. So uh, yeah, for sure. I, I think the, the regulator is obviously doing a, a good job as to what they're doing with the industry, uh, making sure that things are running smoothly uh, there's nobody doing, um, you know, stupidity, transferring assets and whatnot. Uh, at the same time, there's just situations that come up where, unfortunately, it's a lose-lose situation. Not much you can do about it. And the company that bought them maybe doesn't know what they were doing. Um, and you end up in this uh, unfortunate mess. And now everybody's got to deal with the fallout from that. Um, okay. Are there ways to prevent the issues for, for this upcoming winter? So yeah, there, there is ways to prevent it, um, including insulation, including running heat trace, including running uh, more of your methanol on the gas lines. Um, you can run a higher quantity of solvent. You can have a, just, just more insulation on the pipes. And, and there's certain work that can be done for it. Uh, 2022, it doesn't sound like Prospera was ready. So they did have issues with the production uh, for many months until they were able to get it back. So I, it feels like they suffered from some downhole issues uh, along with surface problems. And now I love this question. So it says, 
why Prospera and not other companies? So go, go to the area where Prospera is in and look at the wells that C CNRL has next to them or Synovus or Baytex or Strathcona. Sure, they didn't suffer to the same extent because they were more prepared for it, but there's still wells that went down. Um, and it comes down to when I started the presentation that in the bigger companies, none of this really matters. If you got 200 barrels down on an 80,000 barrel per day company, I mean, you're, you're never going to notice it. Uh, whereas on a Prospera, it went down from 700 to 400. So you did notice it um, a lot more. Um, and yeah, they 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 weren't alone, I'll say, uh, but also they suffered more than their competitors and their peers um, just because they weren't ready. They There was things that they were working on. Um, I think there was legacy issues with, with, with some of the um, sites. There was legacy issues with some of the installation. Uh, I think their operating team was was not the best team at the time. Uh, I have been told that that operating team has been completely switched out. Uh, that was operating the Cuthbert Field in 2022. Um, so there's been changes that have been made. Uh, it's just hard to take a company and go and completely change everything in six months. So when I say it's a process, I really mean that's that it's a process, and you figure out some of the problems when they show up. Right? Maybe 2021 winter wasn't bad. So they didn't realize that the operating team wasn't prepared uh, for, for that kind of winter to occur. And then 2022, now the problem showed up because the winter was harsher uh, in, in the Southern Saskatchewan uh, area. A um, couple of other, other things here. So you can see uh, more, more winter climates just from my time out there. Um, this I also believe is somewhere in the White Court Edson area. Um, this is actually in the Macklin area. So you can see we have a uh, rubber packing that's failed on a pump jack. And therefore, let me see if it plays. Uh, yeah, so, so there's no audio, but you can see it playing here. Um, so, so the pump jack has failed. The packing has failed on the pump jack because it was too cold and it has started leaking oil and water out, which has then proceeded to freeze uh, right where it is and uh, just creating this massive mess here um, and this all happened from when I checked the well the one day to when I came to the well the next day. So in, in under 24 hours, this is what happened. And now what do you do? Now you got to call a steamer. You got to call a vac truck. You have to go and get a new packing. You have to make sure that there's no, no trapped pressure in this system where something has frozen and is going to pop out at you. Uh, when you open the, the, the packing area, you have to go and replace the packing and, it's gonna eat up four to six hours of your day by the time you get everything organized and get the work done and supervise it on just one well. Prospera has hundreds of wells. You can see why this is a problem and why you don't want to overspend by hiring a huge amount of operators just to fix wells when they're just gonna go down again in a month or a week. Um, here also is the LLR. So I, I spoke about the liability ratio on the last uh, slide. Here is what it actually looks like. You have a deemed asset amount and you have a deemed liability amount. Each well has a deemed asset based on its reserves. It has a deemed liability based on the abandonment cost plus reclamation cost. You have active liability and inactive liability. So wells that are operating and wells that are not operating. On facilities, the AER will give you no deemed asset. Why? Because facilities don't produce oil. They have no reserves. You only get a deemed liability. And you add, you add those two up, you get a deemed asset total, you get a deemed liability total, you have your LLR, licensee liability rating, uh, rating or ratio. This needs to be over one for you to be in the AR's good books. This needs to be over two for you to really be able to get every single license and every single uh, application through. That's just how the system works. Uh, in 2022, you had to spend 4% of your inactive liability in ARO as a minimum. In, 2020, uh, in 2024 and onwards, you have to spend 8% of your inactive liability uh, every single year onwards. So just to give you a little bit of a math, when you're looking at the balance sheets or the MDNAs of these companies, look for these specific terms. Um, you may not specifically get the inactive liability, but you can get the total liability and as the new wells come on, you'll see the reserves that get added to those wells really increase your active liability number uh, a lot. Um, 
so that's, I think, all I had to share on that. Uh, also, if you bring any wells that are suspended back into active, now you get a deemed asset that gets added to that. Um, uh, every single month that goes on, you get one twelfth of the deemed asset added, depending on how much barrels the oil uh, barrels the well is producing. Um, okay, and uh, yeah, there was something else I wanted to share on the LLR, but I can't remember, so so it'll come back to me. Um, okay, so the well shacks need a little TLC. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think so, yes. Um, there's a picture posted here in the chat of, of the Prospera uh, drone, uh, the drone that took the, the uh, pictures here uh, earlier this week. So uh, if you haven't seen those, go to the CEO.ca forums on Prospera and you can see the, the drone pictures along with the drilling rig pictures um, as well. Um, and then, yeah, this this well is from the Macklin area uh, in Saskatchewan when I used to operate these um, 2018. So if you don't own facilities, you can drop some liability, maybe contract out facilities rather, rather than owning them. Yeah, yeah. So you you can do that, but then you're paying processing and transportation and you know whatever else on that. So may or may not be a good idea. Uh, this is also where Parity is suffering because they own some of the facilities. Uh, and I think it's, it's costing them a lot of money for turnarounds and the liability portion um, of that. So yeah, I... I, I should just add this information here that I've shared on the LLR. This is not Prospera's LLR. This is a uh, asset that we were looking to buy um, under White Tundra and um, we're looking at this. So that's why I have this information with me. Um, okay, a couple other pictures here. So here is what happens in the early spring. So you have snow on the ground and you got a truck that's just covered with mud. So you can't see anything. It is just a complete mess. Uh, and this is likely what happened with Prospera is they had a very, very rough winter. And then the, the ground was just completely bad uh, for large portions of the spring, which is why a lot of the restarts of the wells happened in March, April, May, as opposed to January and February. So I believe this is a video. Yeah, so you can see um, it's, it's some rough operating conditions out in this heavy oil part of the world. Um, here is a things that can happen in the winter when things snap. So the cold gets into certain fittings, it gets into certain uh, valves and it just snaps. That's metal. Uh, you you put it in under the right condition and you can touch a pipe of steel or, or some sort of fitting and it will just pop off because it becomes so brittle uh, and so, so out of its operating conditions. So I'll just play that again. You can see the kind of mess that's been created in just 24 hours, it has seeped underneath here and all over the uh, road where I was driving on. And then you have, um, this is just a picture, I guess, of the winter as well. So keep in mind, these are rough operating conditions. We are not living in uh, some sort of easy place to operate uh, where, where everything just runs smoothly. This is why a lot of companies fail that come to Canada. The US companies, the Chinese companies, the Russian companies, the Middle Eastern companies, they, they come to Canada thinking it's an easy operating area and they get completely slapped. So it's more expensive and it's just tougher. And your production is not going to be 100% runtime. Just You just got to realize that. You're going to produce at some percentage of your productive capacity. Um, okay, so that's the uh, information on the uh, why did they not meet their production exit rate for 2022. The other concern now is about the um, talking about gross barrels. So so why does management keep talking about we are producing this many barrels on a gross basis? Why, why don't they talk about net barrels? So the reason is they are a acquirers. They are continually acquiring more working interest in their properties. Here you see December 31, 2020 to December 31, 2021. Cuthbert went from 35 to 69%. Hart Hills went from 50 to 83%. Loose land went from 50 to 83%. What they're essentially telling you or indicating to you is that at some point in the near future, they're going to own all those gross barrels. That's what they're saying. That's why they keep using this terminology. You have to read between the tea leaves. What did they do in the last 12 months? Well, they everything is sort of as is. 
but Pus Coupe went from 52% to 68%. So they are slowly working as the money comes in to continually add to their working interest. So the reason they keep reporting gross production is because they want all of this to be at 100% as they go around their operating plan, as they go about their business plan. So, you know, it's just thinking thinking one step further and, and thinking why would they be doing this rather than just blaming them or saying that this is dumb or saying that, you know, this doesn't make any sense. Try to think about what the reasoning is why they're doing it and think about what they've done in the past to agree with that reasoning or hypothesis. And so far, uh, history has proven that they they are continually acquiring more working interest in the assets that they already own. They bought this 28% from Petrolia. So they bought uh, 13% in one acquisition and then they bought 14.6% in another acquisition, um, which both closed in 2022. Okay, um, a quick uh, update. If anybody on the uh, Twitter space would like to join for the Zoom session, uh, whitetundra.ca, scroll to the bottom under events and uh, you can join us for the Zoom. We still have uh, quite a few slides here uh, quite a few interesting things. I I do I did want to address a lot of the concerns, um, just given that I mean they they were put out there, and I think it's important that I share due diligence that I've done um, thus far to to kind of address these things on my end, because a lot of these concerns I I already knew, and we already looked at it in 2022. We already looked at it before participating in the private placement, and we already have looked at them this summer as as the summer has gone on. So. Many of these things were already in my head. I didn't have to do any research, just put it into a presentation. Um, and then there was a couple of things that were new uh, that I asked management about, or I went and read through the MDNAs of the past uh, and kind of figured out, okay, what exactly is going on and put them in here. So uh, th there's some comment here that the best well that Prospera had uh, ever produced was 50 barrels per day. And some of the bad wells were 10 barrels per day. Fair, that's a true statement. Uh, water production is also very high. Another true statement, I hope I've explained well in the last uh, two hours why the water production is just not a big deal. It's it's really not not a concern to me. Um, it's 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 again, I'll I'll keep using the NBA example. So uh, it's like going to NBA player and saying, man, you you're eating a lot of food, dude. like, and he'll go, okay, like so what? I make millions of dollars. I can eat whatever I want, and I gotta feed this body to play the games. So, it's just a matter of fact. If you're producing oil, heavy oil in a water flood, you're going to produce water. Big deal. So that's that on that side. Um, as far as the wells go, so I shared this uh, kind of template or uh, things that have happened in heavy oil in the past. I shared this in my last session on the junior companies. And you can see how the vertical wells have been around for 40 years. The, the chops, cold, heavy oil with produced sand is around for 40 years. We, we know how to produce that. Um, the lined heavy horizontals were in the 2000s. So <laughs> they're, they're a bit higher cost, but there's also some negative impacts where the water can cone in or channel in uh, with these heavy horizontals. You got sand production to deal with. And then some fracked wells came about in 2010, a perfs, I should say. And then the fracked wells came on in 2014. The unlined horizontals came in in late 2014 and then the multilaterals and the disposal wells, et cetera, came in 2015. And then the heavy horizontal water flood came in 2016. Well, what, what happened in late 2014 all the way all the way till 2022? Low oil price. So when you have heavy oil that's hard to produce, higher operating cost, and lower net back, you get lower dollar per barrel on it, sales price. You're not going to go and do all these projects when the price of oil is $50 a barrel and WCS is $35 a barrel US. You're just not gonna do it. It, it doesn't make any sense. So now that we are where we are, the, te the technology uh, upswing on heavy oil is a lot more than the Montney or the Permian or the Viking or the any other reservoir um, that's a frack reservoir or any other reservoir that is a light oil reservoir that had a lot of efficiencies and optimization happen to it in the last seven years. So, you know, believe this or or don't believe it. Uh, this is the timeline as to when these technologies really came out and were deployed um, and why they weren't deployed at mass scale 
in the last seven years. So now that we have $80 oil, we have $65 WCS US, uh, we're going to see a lot more of these technologies come and be deployed and be optimized uh, going forward. So going and saying that their best well was 50 barrels per day. Yeah, sure. That well was drilled in 2013. And 2013, we, di we didn't even have the right uh, perfing or the uh, 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 fracks and the longer horizontals. We didn't have the water flood work for heavy oil. Uh, we had very little for polymer flooding. Uh, you saw that Baytex property that Murphy owned. It just started its phase one and two in uh, 2012, 2013. So a lot of upside. Uh, it's why I'm investing in this name. So you can say, well, how come it's not de-risked? Well, if it was de-risked, you might be paying a lot higher share price in order to get into the name or or or, or to who, who owns it, the share price might already be a lot higher, right? So there's always risk in everything. You just have to find situations where the asymmetry on risk reward may be worth it to you. My opinion, this is not investment advice. This is my opinion on why I'm an investor in this company. The, techno the technological upside uh, is to me a much bigger um, uh, reasoning or, or much bigger uh, piece of the cake on the end there than uh, some of the other technologies that that have already been optimized. Um, okay, here is another field to show you that water production is irrelevant. So here's another Strathcona field. This is just to the north, um, well, just to the east of uh, Prospera's fields near Macklin. And 3,000 barrels per day oil, 125,000 barrels per day water. Is uh, Strathcona a water production company as well? Uh, or are they doing pretty well with their soon to IPO on the public markets? So uh, I'm going to keep hammering this point just because uh, I think it needs to be made. Water comes with oil. When you produce them, you produce them together. The water cut is completely irrelevant if you have the uh, facilities to process them and if you have the facilities to dispose of that water. The Permian Basin produces 20 million barrels of water a day. Just the Permian Basin produces 20 million barrels of water per day. We know we know as humans how to deal with water. We know in the oil industry how to deal with water. Um, okay, so yeah, um, so a couple other wells I just want to show. So these these are some of the vertical wells that are near Prospera's uh, where they're drilling right now. Um, look at what they came on at. So. 80 barrels per day, and then came down to about 40 barrels per day, went down in 2019, and then was restarted in 2021 at about 20 barrels per day. So the IP rate was pretty good, uh, but no pressure support. As you can see, the water rate is not rising, meaning that there's no pressure support on the well. And, uh, you know, once again, you can see that you can say the top well was 50 barrels per day, but this is a newer well in 2017. Uh, Prospera never drilled any wells on their fields after 2013. So you're essentially running 10-year-old technology. When we look at what's going on today, uh, there, there are wells that have come out better. Uh, we see wells over here. This is a Baytex well, I believe, uh, came on at 60 barrels per day, and then it's been producing at about 30 to 40 barrels per day. Here's your, your low decline. When I say low decline wells, this is what I mean. Uh, you have this very flat, overall flattish production profile over four years. This one has water rates going up, which tells me that there is some sort of water flooding uh, or natural aquifer drive here uh, in this reservoir. Um, so the next concern is that the, the decline rate of Prospera is looking worrisome. So I shared about the jagged way that these wells produce and why. Here's another Baytex well that you can see why it produces up and down, up and down, sometimes pretty majorly. Um, and then, of course, you have the weather impacts on top of that. So, um, you know, am I concerned about this latest month? Um, to an extent, yes. Uh, do I want to explain why that happened in July? Sure. Um, does it really bother me to the point where I'm going to exit the position? No. So it happens. We we've seen these kinds of drops and then and then rebounds as well. Um, obviously April was a lot of flush production because of the wells coming online after being down for six months. So as they restarted, they came on strong, and they came down a bit. Um, I don't think this is natural decline. I think some of the wells have um, gone down. 
I have not done the full analysis on the July production um, because I just, again, I just don't think it's that big of a deal. Um, I want to see the drilling results and what comes out of that. And I would like to see the production in August rebound. Yes, I don't want to see drop another 100 barrels. I would be really concerned at that point that there's something that's gone wrong um, on, on one of the facilities or on some of the wells uh, slash water flooding patterns. And here's another vertical well. You can see over eight years, it hasn't declined. So it's only producing 15 barrels per day. It has no natural water uh, drive. That's that's enough to really push the, the rates up. And it's been producing at 15 barrels per day roughly for eight years. So uh, low decline means low decline. I, I'm not talking about 20% decline rate is low. I'm talking roughly 0% decline rate. And I know some petroleum engineers are going to shoot me for saying 0% decline rate. Uh, but roughly, basically negligible uh, decline rate. Okay, so um, now you ask me, okay, well, how how can this be? Like, how how can there be so many assets that are left out there and they haven't been drilled horizontally? Like, you must be lying. You must be uh, just saying stuff to get us to invest in this company. Um, you know, maybe there was uh, like, like, how come nobody drilled this so far? If it was so good, how come nobody has done this? Okay, fair concern. So let me give you an example. This is the Lower Manville in Southern Alberta near the town of Brooks. So not, not the Brooks Pakisco wells that Prospera is drilling, but the Lower Manville in Brooks, the Lower Manville being the zone that Prospera is in, in their heavy oil fields. Okay, so I did a, I did a test. Producing formation is Lower Manville. The spud date is before January 1st, 2016, and the licensee is Torxin which was the Schlumberger company, very well capitalized, lots of money. Uh, they're able to do whatever they want, really. Uh, they were the ones that were drilling those Pekisco wells in this area, uh, exactly. So they had the money to drill. They had the money to go and go with these fields, but lower manville, heavier oil, lower netbacks. So you can see all the wells here on the map, spud before 2016. Shorter horizontals, some verticals, these are abandoned wells. This symbol is abandoned and this is suspended. So, okay, few drills. Here is after 2016. There you go. A bunch of horizontals, all producing really, really well. Some of these wells are making two, 300 barrels per day. Short, stubby, cheap horizontals. Only perf, only jet perfs, no frack here. This is relatively cheap drilling. And there you go, there is your field. And, uh, What's, what's the difference between Prospera and Torxen? Torxen just had the money in 2016 uh, and they were willing to drill these wells at a lower oil price environment. That's it. The technology is new. There's fields where that technology has still not been used, which is why we're here. We're all here in this room to begin with. What is the production profile on some of these wells? There you go. Came on at 150 barrels per day and three years down the road, three and a half years down the road, it's still making... 60 barrels per day. Here are some of the other ones that are a little bit of hard decline wells. So came on at 400 barrels per day, not, not to be expected. And now it's still producing about 20 barrels per day. Uh, well, 20, yeah, 20 barrels per day, uh, six years down the road. It was producing at 50 barrels per day for four years, 50 plus barrels per day for four years. Low decline. This is what we want. This is what makes money. Um, and here is the overall field as a whole. So this is all the lower manville wells that Torxen has had in this area. You see the vertical production, 5,000 barrels per day out of just, just these wells here, that's it. Most of them abandoned and they were producing 5,000 barrels per day. And then it just declined, 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 nothing happened. Why? Because heavy oil horizontal drilling had not been deployed. Heavy oil water flooding had not been deployed the perf methodologies in heavy oil had not been deployed. And Torxen could do nothing except sit there, let the wells decline, and then well, bam They drilled 50 wells, maybe. Is it maybe 50 wells in this picture? And they brought the production back up from 1,000 barrels per day to 6,000 barrels per day. And now, four years later, it's still producing 3,000 barrels per day. Uh, possibly foreshadowing here, very similar zone, very similar production timeline, 
very similar ways that they're producing these wells. The water cuts are reasonable. This this doesn't even look like a water flooded field. It looks like a natural flow. We can see the water rate has come down as the oil rate came down. Um, I love I love doing analysis on adjacent fields and fields that have similar production characteristics and profiles because it tells you, it gives you an insight into the future as to what's happening. It also answers the question, how come nobody's done this before? Because there's fields that just, the, the company just didn't have the money to do this and they did not have the right operator. They didn't have, they didn't want to do, do this in a $35 WCS environment. It just doesn't make sense. Torxon did. And thankfully we have the production results from that to show you. Yeah, so um, that, that answers that question to me. I'm, I'm very, very much following this field here. Um, I, I see this as a good proxy to the Manville of uh, Prospera. And I've shared the maps here, just so if, if anybody wants to go and do their own research, um, you can go, go back and kind of look at this area with the LSDs um, that I've shared as well. Okay, so the next concern is that the uh, they're misreporting production. So they're saying that they're at 1,000 BOEs per day, but yet they're only at 520 barrels per day. Okay, so uh, rookie mistake. Barrels is not the same as BOE. When you say barrels of oil equivalent, you're talking about oil plus gas. So my Petro Ninja shows July at 561 barrels. Um, this concern is saying that production was at 520. Okay, we'll use 520. So 520 oil plus 1,486 cubic feet uh, per day of gas. So not MMCF, but MCF per day. And I've got a very nice handy free to use calculator up here. 1,486 of MCF per day. 263 BOEs. So 520 of oil plus 263 of gas, we're at 785 BOEs per day, net. Prospera roughly owns 78 working uh, percent working interest in their wells. We shared this on one of the previous slides here when I talked about the acquisition. So I'll just go back to it. So we have everything here. So 78 exact percent weighted average working interest, okay? So 520 oil, 263 gas, 783 BOEs per day at 78% working interest. That's 1,005 BOEs per day gross. I don't think anything else needs to be said uh, about this specific concern. So the next one. The speaking of Samuel David, uh, he has used the company as his piggy bank. He has used, uh, received a million dollars in compensation and they had lands that were sold uh, to, to the company by him for $2.5 million. Okay. So 2020 comp, 2021, 2022, 2023, fair, absolute fair concern. The Quantera is also a fair concern. And then the assets that were bought from the CEO directly are also listed here as $2.5 million. Okay. The second concern on this is that they own a, the CEO owns a consulting company and the company employs family members. Um, uh, but the number of related party transactions is enough to discredit Prospera. Fair. Okay. So what exactly has happened here? So the first thing I want to show you is that Matthew Kenna has received zero compensation. So the salary fee is zero. He received $76,000 of option awards in 2021 and no option awards in 2022. So the point I made about him earlier, you can see the data now showing that. Quantera Oil and Gas has received 204,000 of option-based awards in 2021. We see that in the same year, Samuel David only got paid 55,000 for the work that he did. So essentially he got paid 55,000 directly and his consulting company, Quantera, got 204,000 of option-based awards. Now, what does option-based awards mean? So he got 3 million warrants with a strike price of 5 cents. That was the option-based award. When the options were given out in March, uh, were approved in March of 2021, 
And when they were given out in August of 2021, the, the share price of Prospera was five cents. So what was the value on the warrants? The value was the Black-Scholes model of the future uh, time value of it. They He got them at five cents. The strike was five cents. They, in essence, were at the money. And then there was a time value associated with it. In the time frame from then till now, you have had to create value in the company if those warrants had to be worth something. If the share price was still at five cents, those those options are only worth the time value of what of what they are worth. But because value was created by the CEO in the company, those options are worth more now than they were when they were given out. That's why the option-based awards number looks inflated when in reality, it just reflects the value that was created in the company in that time frame. So um, I think this is pretty common. Um, I have my own consulting company also that I run, White Tundra Resources, under, under my uh, uh, domain, I guess. Most petroleum engineers or consultants or well site supervisors have a consulting company incorporated that they run. Nothing about this is odd or strange. Um, there are certain tax benefits to doing it this way. There's also certain things you can write off in a corporation, which you, you you should be writing off, like your truck and your tools and your laptop and your softwares. If you're going to be consulting, why should you be personally paying for that if you're using those for your work-related uh, expenses? So not not too concerned about this part of it. Um, the $2.5 million, yes, I will I will discuss that here. So the $2.5 million was given for the Brooks property. There was a uh, $400,000 uh, debenture and then, or sorry, a $300,000 debenture and then about a $2.1 million um, uh, promissory note that was given for the other 50% of the wells that were recompleted. So the, the concern here being that uh, this money was given to the CEO of the company for a related party transaction um, I share the same concern. So this is the first one where I do share the same concern. I think that this was not well explained. Uh, I think there is a bit of a asterisk or red flag here um, that the corporation needs to work towards proving out. Okay, so it's it's too early yet to say whether this was a good decision or not. They have press released some results the results are not proper results. They're they're just flow tests. We want to see what these wells come on at. And I also want to see what the eight Brooks wells uh, will end up at. So I should just clarify one thing. So the when I answered the question earlier about the exit production of the company, and I'm saying 50 barrels per day, you have to adjust that for the working interest and the and the ownership that Prospera has in it. So I didn't do it when I ran that calculation. I will leave that up to uh, you to do that for now. And then I'll I'll put out an actual number that I think once the first results start coming out, we can change that, um, uh, what our estimation is for year-end production um, as the first few well results start coming out. So uh, on this, this specific issue, they need to now prove that these lands were good. They paid $2.5 million for them to the CEO uh, who also owns 50% of them. So if you own 50% of something, you you still want those wells to pan out. You don't just want to take the money and run. You you, If you can make the wells pan out and you get the 2.5 million, it seems like a win-win transaction. Um, so they do have to prove this out from the drilling program. They do have to prove this out with the two recompletions. And we'll see how they end up. It's too early yet. It is a true concern. This This one, yes, uh, I will be continuing to track this very closely um, as the months go on here, how those wells pan out and uh, what sort of um, production rates and working um, sort of uh, capital efficiency that the corporation got from doing this deal. Now, one thing I will say to kind of counteract that concern, the same way that petroleum engineers and geologists run their own incorporations, some of them own wells. Some of them own mineral rights in that corporation. Some of them own properties that they came upon 20 years ago and they said, wow, this is a really good well log, but the company I'm working for doesn't want to do anything with it. Okay, and then five years later, that company goes under or they get bought out. 
now this individual goes back and says, hey, sell me those mineral rights or sell me these wells because I think they're worth, they're going to be worth a lot in the future. They keep them. They just keep them in their corporation for years and years and years. When the time comes, when the technology reaches uh, a mature stage, when the price of oil is high enough, now they go and develop those lands. Okay, this is something that shouldn't be done in this manner. The, 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 the non-arms length transaction, I think, is a weird way to do it. At the same time, if it pans out, you've essentially bought a property for its market value, depending on how the wells pan out. So I don't agree with the way that it was done. But if a CEO of a company is an engineer or geologist and they own land or wells uh, outside of, of their role, which they think it makes sense to bring into the company and amalgamate the two, and it pans out, and I make money on the stock price and, and the production of the company goes up, I don't know how much I can say against that. So the optics on it are really strange, um, but many geologists and, and engineers you will talk to will tell you the same thing, that, hey, I remember this well I worked on seven years ago where we lost this tool in the well and it was making 40 barrels per day and then the company just went under or our engineer got fired and then nobody wanted to look at that well again. So we all have these stories. I can tell you this from personal experience. I know wells in the Macklin area I want to buy. I know wells in the Simonette area I want to buy. I know wells in the Cardium, in the Wapiti Cardium that I would buy. If I had the right sort of money or if the company that was operating them went under uh, or if they did not renew their mineral rights license, I would go and buy them and put them under my corporation because I know they're going to be worth more as time goes on or there's wells have operated where somebody just lost the plot they shut in a well that was making 10 barrels or 20 barrels uh, because there was some problem with it that i think i can fix for a lot cheaper they think it's a hundred thousand dollar job i think it's a ten thousand dollar job twenty thousand dollar job what whatever the the reasoning for it is anybody that's worked in the field has those wells well, guess who worked in the field for many, many, many years? Samuel David, the CEO. And that's why I personally, um, I feel like I have more of a leeway, very, very slightly more leeway to this. I am still, I think, concerned. I don't like the optics of it. I don't want this to repeat. I think I'd rather the company buy assets from arm's length parties um, going forward. Um, if those wells don't work out, will the shareholders have taken on all the risk and the previous owner gets a nice payday? Yep. 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 That that's exactly why this concern has been brought up by the individual making the tweet and why I'm telling you my honest opinion that I think that uh, shareholders are taking on the large portion of the risk here. Um, so what I will leave you with is it's too early. So we, we have our pitchforks out here, um, and, and we'll see how the Brooks wells pan out. We'll see how the recompletions pan out and then we will act accordingly. Yeah. Do you think he paid less than 3 million for them? Oh, 100%. Yeah, because it's it's just land and it was two wells that they bought from Torxen, um, or, or that he bought from Torxen, if I'm not mistaken, um, that were, I don't know, like suspended for the last 15 years. They, they were abandoned in 2003, if I'm not mistaken. So they were just sitting there and I don't think he paid much for them. But again, I, I don't think it's right to look at every transaction like that. You know, like if you're buying a house and you go and talk to the owner and you're like, hey, what did you pay for this in 1994? Or what did you pay for this in 2007? You know, they'll slap you because that's that's not how you make transactions. You, you, you can't just go and say, what did you pay for it? So I'm going to give you 20% more than that. And that's a deal. You, you, you look at what the asset could be worth or what the market price would be for something like that. In this case, we don't know. We we just don't have enough information on the wells and how they've panned out. Uh, once the production results are out, I will definitely be doing a full cycle analysis on whether the transaction was worth it or not, or could they have used the money for other things? Because it's not just, oh, the transaction made money. It's what could he have used that money for instead? And perhaps there was a way to make more money there. Um, uh, on on that uh, on that cash dollar that you had. Um, okay, so 
Yeah, so so the seventy eight percent working interest is just a weighted average. So certain wells they'll have one hundred percent, certain wells they'll have fifty, certain wells they might be five percent, certain wells they'll be eighty five. Uh, it just depends who the working interest partner is. Um, not all the fields have the same partner for all the wells. You could have certain wells with newer partners. You could have certain wells that are vertical with older partners. Um, it, it just sort of depends. Um, but I'm sure they have certain wells with 100% working interest, uh, for sure. And they operate every single well that they own. Uh, every single well that they have working interest in, they operate. That is my understanding of the situation, which gives them more uh, leeway as to what they want to do with uh, with the development plan and the optimization plan. Yeah. Okay, so that is that. Uh, okay, so the next uh, concern was that the company has generated minus 15 million of free cash flow. Yes, this was well understood. It was a company that needed to do a lot of work on the um, the 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 overall restructuring, the getting the barrels back, getting the capex uh, to drill to do the two side tracks last year. The capex to buy the um, assets, the Brooks assets, and then just negative cash flow that they're running because of higher operating cost and issues with the winter. Um, you know, we can do re-review analysis all we want. Uh, I I mean, we we could do this uh, all day long. It's it's like looking at a uh, again. We'll we'll stick with the same theme of uh, uh, metaphors. Is you know you've got a you've got a very 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 skilled player. Um, who just has a bad, bad time. Uh, he goes into some sort of public uh, problem. They get into some sort of drinking and drugs and uh, falls off somewhere, falls off a bike and breaks his leg. And then, you know, he he's now 90% recovered and on the up and up. And then you go and say, oh no, we, you know, we don't want this player because uh, they've had all these issues in the past. Yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. That's a completely fair statement. But the individual, the team that's willing to bet on that on that player. And if that player pans out, you're, you're feeling pretty good because you got him for free as a free agent, um, off the market. So yes, there was, there was issues with the company. Yes. It's run negative cash flow. Yes. They fixed a lot of problems. Yes. They've more than three X, maybe four X production, uh, from the low point. They bought other working interests in the properties they own. They fixed up the 400 non-compliances. They've abandoned the 60 wells. So yeah, they've, done things with that 15 million negative cash flow doesn't mean it's a bad company we we got to be careful associating uh things with the wrong wrong terminology uh companies that are digging uh, getting themselves out 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 of a hole that they've got pushed into um need to be negative cash flow uh for a little bit as as they get themselves back on the ground and you've got two investors here that are businessmen who have been involved with this right from the start peter lacy dave richardson uh, Peter Lacey being the founder and chairman of Service Equipment. Well, here's the news release. Service Equipment, August 2021, got bought out for $302 million. Is this guy just dumb? He he doesn't understand cash flow and negative cash flow? Or maybe he got hip, uh, hypnotized when he put the money in? Um, or maybe he just understands that when you build a business, uh, that's, that's a restructuring value, um, uh, a strong value business, you need to have some growing pains. You need to have some months and years of negative cash flow. You need to have some months where you're struggling with getting the projects done. You want to get done. Uh, you have some some unforeseen problems come about. Uh, Dave Richardson being the other one, um, obviously part of the Richardson family who are involved with uh, the Richardson agribusiness, Tundra Oil and Gas uh, in, in the Manitoba, Verdon area, and then as well as all these other companies that I will uh, let you read. Um, and then his his uh, background being in the food sector. So founded companies that have created new grains, they have uh, created new manufacturers of, of uh, proteins, pea proteins. So forward thinking, not interested in the status quo, forward thinking um, as to where he wants things to go um, on, on these sorts of things. And uh, this one is going to be hilarious because there was a lot of fun made about him talking about the B, the B thing. Like he wants to be green, uh, be as in honeybees, um, and 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 people were saying, you know, what's going on with this guy? Like like he's not wanting to make money. He just wants to be green. Um, and I I can't say that this is for sure what happened, 
but for those that have for those that have operated in this area, the Looseland area, the Macklin area, the Weyburn, Provost, Lloyd Minster area, you will frequently see this in the summer and fall. You have, you have beekeepers that put uh, honeybees near the crops and the oil wells uh, because they they can really generate a lot of honey from the the crops and the flowers growing in that area. Um, so it it was so obvious to me who has actually been to the field in in this uh, Manville area ever and who is uh, content with throwing jokes, uh, but in the essence, kind of playing themselves because you're 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 showing how little field experience you have, uh, meaning you've never been to the field in the summer or fall ever. Uh, but you know this this is what I really like about having worked in the field and people who who have been out there. Um, there's certain things that make no sense to people living in Calgary or in other parts of the world. They 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 just don't understand the the little tips and tricks and the nuances uh, and the things we do in the field. So, um, you know, call it good, call it bad. It just is what it is. Um, so yeah, pretty interesting. I I believe they must be doing the same in Verdon, Manitoba, which is why the the topic came up. Um, yeah, so here is a little bit of history on the wells that were recompleted. The concern was that the production was not brought back online. Um, and yeah, that's a fair concern. So these zones were abandoned in, in 2005. Um, I'm of the opinion that there's not enough infrastructure there to flow these wells. Uh, and they didn't want to spend the money on that uh, while the company was sort of in a precarious position in a sense where they would rather drill wells than go and um, build out infrastructure for just two recompletions. And keep in mind the two recompletions are far away. They're not. They're not right next to each other. There, there. There's a distance between them, such that they might have needed to build two different facilities to handle this, especially if they were producing water. And you can see Pakisco formation was where the refrac happened in uh, late 2022. Uh, okay. So the next concern that got brought up was the netback plan is untenable. Um, they wouldn't get paid for this under until September 25th. Okay. Um, they're, they're already carrying a lot of, um, accrued payments and they're already carrying a lot of accrued receivables. So I think they are, they should be pretty aware of the fact that they're not going to get paid for 60 days or 30 days. Uh, if they don't know that, I think there's bigger problems within the company. So I don't see this as a real concern. Um, you know, anybody who's worked in the oil patch knows things work on a net 30 or a net 60 or a net 90. Um, common, common kind of, those are the rules of the game that we play. And it talks about the field, the maximum field production was 650 barrels per day. At 3x productivity, you get to 1800 BOEs per day. So I don't know why barrels and BOE is once again got confused here. Um, these wells do produce gas. So um, you know, we have to be careful just saying heavy oil is just all uh, oil. There, There is uh, associated gas that, that can get produced with some of these. And hey, if this field, I don't know what exactly the, the comment is, like 3x productivity of what. Uh, but but if the field does make 1,800 BOEs per day, man, I'm very happy. Even at a $20 net back, that's $13 million of cash flow a year. Like I'll, on a $40 million market cap and making that just from one field, I'd be very happy. And the $20 net back is completely conservative because in Q2, with WTI averaging $74 a barrel, they made a $25 net back. So I'm taking 20% off the net back and I'm leaving my WTI strip at the $74 a barrel. And it generates $13 million a year in cash flow if they can get to 1,800 uh, BOEs, let's say barrels per day, uh, out of this field. Sounds good to me. I would have no problem if Cuthbert is making 1,800 BOEs. Um, even at 80% oil, I'd, I'd be very happy. Uh, and uh, the net back will only improve because as you have more barrels in a field, your operating cost per barrel should come down even more. So uh, yeah, come at me. 1,800 barrels, if I wake up one day and see that, yeah, yeah, I, I, I feel like I just exited a dream. Um, so all is well. Um, okay, and then the next concern is talking about the oil water contact, um, which, I mean, is always a concern. Any heavy oil well that has underlying bottom water 
or even Edgewater um, has the concern of drilling into the oil water contact. Sure. So don't don't really see what the concern is. Water saturation is extremely high. Yeah, we already know that from the previous wells that are drilled in the area. We see this well from 2013. The water starts off slow. And then by about five years down the road, you're running at about a 90 plus percent, maybe 95 percent water cut. This is already known information. There's there's nothing new here that is a concern. Um, it just is what it is. It's it's uh, it's just how these wells are. Um, so I think whenever you drill a well, there's, there's always a risk that you will go into the oil water contact uh, in part of your horizontal because of geologic movements, because of some sort of up dip, uh, a, a sort of geology. You could have uh, a uh, intrusion of some sort in part of your horizontal, um, you could go out of zone to the to the top side where you exit the oil zone. Uh, for parts of that, it's it it's sort of always a risk. Um, there is seismic studies and coring and logging that can fix it, but you're not going to core an entire horizontal. You can't core along your entire. Uh, you can't run a well log around your your entire horizontal. Well logs are usually run on vertical wells, or they're run on horizontals as you're drilling the well. So um, to say that we don't have enough information, sure. It's it's the same as like me saying, oh my God, I gotta, I gotta drive to Target to grab groceries, but I might get in an accident. So I'm just not even gonna go. Um, well, how, how are you gonna, how are you gonna de-risk that? Unless you wait and you ban every single person from driving and then you could still crash into a pole. So what do you do? You just sit there and starve to death? Or do you go and take a shot at something with the best educated information you have? So we've drilled hundreds of thousands of wells into uh, heavy oil um, across North America. So, yeah. Are you concerned about the accounts payable? Um, so I will actually discuss this here in one of the upcoming slides. Um, are those net BOEs or gross BOEs? Um, so I don't know which slide you're specifically referring to. Um, maybe this one, I, I don't know what the 1800 referred to. So, um, maybe I'll wait for a clarification and then, and then get back to you on that. Um, but yeah, I, I will discuss with the accounts payable here shortly. So, um, there's a comment about they, they never ran logs to identify the water contact. Um, the wells are too wet for polymer flooding. Um, okay. Polymer flooding usually works with water. You, you the, the polymer itself doesn't provide pressure to the formation. You need the water or some sort of inherent uh, pressure support in the formation for polymer to work. So saying that the wells are too wet to do polymer, um, I don't know what it means. It's like saying I'm going to get to the, I'm going to shower, but I'm scared of getting too wet. Like doesn't really make sense. So um, again, not not really concerned about this. Um, and then the polymer is a very cheap trial. I'm not saying it's going to work. I've never said that the polymer is a is a bang on 100% success rate. We're going to try it. We're going to spend a few hundred thousand dollars and do the pilot. If it works, then we expand it. If it doesn't work, we try a different polymer. If that doesn't work, we try a third polymer. If that doesn't work, then we, the company has a business decision to make. Uh, maybe there's a different type of um, solvent flood or something else here that could work. So um I'll sort of leave that up to when when the time comes. It's just too early right now to say. Um, and then, yeah, the, the running the logs part, I mean, sure. Again, we we don't have all the information to isolate the water contact. We we know there's a bottom water contact. Sure, we'll drill into the zone and it's a two to six meter, seven meter net pay. That's more than enough to drill a horizontal into. We've seen people drill horizontals into two meter pays now uh, in the Lloydminster and the uh, Cummings formation in the Manville, it's you know drilling into seven, six, seven meter pay, and trying to avoid oil water contact, not not really a a real concern, um, in my opinion. So there's a question here: what what do you think the polymer flood will cost? Um, I mean, I I don't really know. I'm thinking the pilot should cost five hundred thousand or less. So that will give you one well or two wells. It's it's not going to give you that much information. It's going to just tell you, is the polymer flood working? 
and what is the response on it on the other side? Keep in mind, a polymer flood, it takes six to 12 months to show up. You can't just inject polymer today and tomorrow you're, you're asking for what happened. You have to wait for that polymer to work its way through the formation and show up with that oil bank on the other side. So for how long they want to run the injection for is going to depend, uh, uh, the cost is going to depend on exactly that. So if they only want to run two months of injection, maybe cost less. If they want to run, if they have three or four wells in the area and they want to run six months of injection, it's going to cost a bit more. But I think after the new wells are drilled, the polymer cost is essentially uh, absorbed into the operations. So it's not going to be like a $5 million or $10 million um, cost. That's my understanding right now, uh, following polymer uh, uh, injection very closely in various fields in Alberta and Saskatchewan right now. So um, yeah, so, so talking about accounts payable, I think I like to use this analogy and people don't, don't really like it, but if this company was, got, was gonna go under, why didn't it go under during COVID? Why didn't it go under in $30 oil when it had only 2 million uh, or sorry, 3 million of current assets. It only had uh, 11 million of total assets. Actually in December, 2020, it only had 4 million of total assets and it had 19 million of total liabilities. And it had 8 million of, of accounts payable back then too. Why Why didn't it go, go under then? And what is gonna make it go under right now? Did, did one of the payable guys suddenly say, oh yeah, I'm gonna, I, I woke up one day and I chose violence. I'm, I'm just gonna take this, company under today. Doesn't usually happen. Is it always a risk? Sure. Um, should we go and emphasize, overemphasize that risk and get, uh, you know, one of those jet jet planes with the banner? Should we take that and fly it around and say, hey, this company might go under? Um, sure. You know, be my guest. The, the reality is it didn't go under during COVID. So unless you have a clear reason as to why it's going to go under, there's no point just rehashing the same thing and saying, oh, the liability is too high or, or the, the uh, net asset ratio is not high enough uh, because it wasn't high enough last year and it wasn't high enough in 2021 or 2020. And the price of oil now is 3x what it was in 2020. So again, a valid concern, yes. But the when you when you dig deeper into it, the reasoning as to why that concern would come to reality is just not correct. So... Maybe something has changed. Am I missing something? I, I would love to hear about it. Did, did something change in the share ownership of the debt? Did, did something change? Maybe there's a debt transaction. The debt got moved from a receiver uh, or sorry, from a party to a court appointed receiver. Maybe somebody sent it to collections. Okay, now, now there's a real concern, but I don't see any information that is showing um, that to be the case. So just my opinion. That's how I see risk in these things is if they wanted to go under, they, they would have gone under three years ago, or they would have gone under in 2021 or 2022. Now, um, tell me why, tell me exactly why not, not just, don't just point at the red, the red button. Tell me what's, what's going to cause somebody to press that red button. Um, okay. So we're actually quite, quite a ways into this, uh, much longer than I thought. So I'm going to go through here a few other things. So the lost circulation event, yep, it happened last year. They junked a well. They paid $800,000 for it. It was one of the two wells that I, I referred to right at the beginning of the presentation. Um, one of them is making that 25, 30, 35 barrels per day. The other one got junked because of lost circulation. And here's what happens in lost circulation. So when you're drilling into a formation, you can have many things that cause lost circulation and then it becomes a thief zone. It just takes away all your drilling mud. It takes away everything and your and your bit just gets jammed somewhere uh, in a weird spot. And sometimes you have to abandon the well. Sometimes you can pull it out. Uh, sometimes you just, you're too far into the hole and you have to let everything go, cut, cut your drill pipe and move on. So what can cause lost circulation? Well, cavernous formations, high pressure gas faults, they will create kicks and cause lost circulation. A high perm formation that you never expected. It just steals all your, all your drilling mud. Natural fractures, induced fractures. If you're drilling with too much pressure, you can create fractures. The well trajectory effect, 
when you go and you start drilling at an angle, you create stresses on on the um, outside of your pipe because it's it's a it's an expansionary area, um, and then depleted formation, and depleted formation is what caused this loss circulation. So they had an area that had already produced a bunch of gas and oil, and there was a sort of little bit of probably sand production, which created unconsolidation. And as they went in, um, that depleted area just started thiefing away the um, the the drilling mud and the fluids, and well, bam, something got stuck downhole. The entire drilling report is on Petroninja for anybody that wants to read it. Um, and and they tried a few things, I believe. They they tried to go and fish the tools out, um, but nothing nothing really happened, and they had to abandon the well. Um, happens. If I had more time to do this presentation, uh, I will find three, five, seven, ten examples of this exact same thing happening to Baytex and happening to uh, Surge and happening to Obsidian or happening to Tamarack Valley. The, the This is not unknown things. This is a risk when you do sidetracks. When you sidetrack into a depleted formation, you take a risk. It doesn't always work out. Uh, you're trying to save money by 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 just going into an existing drill you're trying to save money on the casing. You're trying to save money on the cement job. You're trying to save money on the drilling bit. And sometimes it doesn't work out, which is why I like the fact that they have a 10 well program this time, because in 10 wells, you you minimize the chance that one or two failure or, or one failure destroys your entire economics around your program. It's the same reason people batch drill, Montney, Viking, uh, Cardium, et cetera. Because when, when you drill one or two wells, there's a risk. Um, the other thing is this this comment mentions that the well loss control could happen again this year and that there's a reasonable chance of it. Um, they're not sidetracking any wells this year. So everything is a new drill. Um, it could happen the same way that, uh, that anything could happen. It's the same way that uh, somebody could fall out of a plane and die. It's the same way, that, it's the same as anything else. When when something, when a freak incident happens once, you can't just say, oh, what's well, gonna happen again? Uh, and there's a reasonable chance of it. Sure, there's a reasonable chance uh, of it, but um, it's not the same plane and it's not the same person. So I think, uh, again, overemphasis on things is what's the problem here. It's not that these aren't valid concerns. It's just, Overemphasis trying to push a certain narrative, um, which is fine. It it allows me to share why these are not uh, as as big of a concerns as it needs to be. Um, and again, I will repeat: they they are not sidetracking any wells this year. Meaning, the only way this could happen is if they're drilling a horizontal and they drill into an area that was depleted, which they weren't aware of. So. Maybe it does happen in that sense, but you would be, again, overemphasizing risks that uh, may or may not happen. And I, I feel very comfortable with an 18-well program and a 10-well heavy oil program um, rather than a three or four-well program because then the freak accident risk just becomes too much because one one well not panning out is, is a big dent in what you were expecting. If you have 10 wells, you still don't want one well to not pan out, but but I'll tell you the reality of drilling into heavy oil, the reality of drilling into the Viking or the Montney is you drill 10 wells, eight will be decent, one will be complete junk, and one will be really, really good. That's, that's kind of the way that we run uh, things. That's why we invented the type curve. The type curve doesn't work on a one well drilling program. The type curve works on a 200 well program, and then you're at the type curve. Um, okay. I think this is the last one. So the last concern here talks about the corporate modeling showing horizontal and vertical wells as the same productivity. Um, so it talks about the production forecast. It talks about the modeling horizontal wells at the same productivity as verticals. Um, yeah, that's true. We... We've shown that in the past. The vertical wells uh, in some of the formations like the Pekisco or the slant wells in the heavy oil, uh, because of the way the formations are, 
can sometimes produce the same barrel as a horizontal well. It's it's not strictly reservoir um, contact. It's not strictly the length of your horizontal. Um, in a property like Brooks, which is undrilled in the Pekisco, you have virgin reservoir pressure. In the horizontal heavy oil, you have depleted reservoir pressure. Um, you have some of the oil has already been produced. You have 8% of the oil, or, or in the case of this drilling program this year, 11% of the oil has already been produced. Well, the first 11% is always going to be your easiest 11%. So you're, you're effectively saying that a vertical in a new formation, undrilled formation, is going to produce the same as a horizontal in a formation depleted under primary recovery. Sounds pretty reasonable to me. I, I don't see any concern with making that sort of statement. Um, I think that's a completely normal statement. And um, he, uh, where, where am I here? So here, here are some of the wells that have been uh, produced vertically in the Pekisco. There's only two wells, 100 barrels per day, 150 barrels per day. So previously I showed you four Pekisco wells that were horizontals ranging between 150 and 500 barrels per day. So again, new formation, hard to make full conclusions, but some of the vertical wells are making more in the Pekisco than the horizontal wells in the Manville. There's only two wells. I unfortunately don't have information. Um, there's only two vertical Pekisco wells that were drilled after 2015. I think I had 2015 as my as my uh, beginning of the data points um, because I wanted to use the latest the latest information. Um, and here, two wells, verticals, producing more than horizontal manvils. The proof is in the pudding. And here is a small field in the manvil, uh, a, a part of the manvil. This is a Dyna formation. There's one vertical well and two horizontal wells here. We can see this reservoir has bottom water, bottom aquifer water. How do we know that? Because as the oil rate dropped, the water rate didn't drop. It actually went up, which means the water is coning or the water is channeling into the well. So here's the vertical well, the one in the center, drilled in 2007. Came on at 100 barrels per day, was at 50 barrels per day for a while, 40 barrels per day for a while, and then 20 barrels per day for the next two or three years. Great. Here are the two horizontal wells, right here, right next to them, right next to it, drilled exactly one year later. So it wasn't like the zone got depleted a huge amount in the first year. And look at this horizontal well. It came on at 30 barrels per day and died right away at 10 barrels per day. The other horizontal well never produced. It only produced for two months at about 25 barrels per day and then died. So in this case, the vertical well produced way more than the horizontal well. Why? Because when you have a underlying aquifer bottom water on a vertical, there's only one point where that water can channel or cone. Or on a horizontal, all you need is one area of that horizontal to get water coning or channeling, and the water will overrun the oil and start producing straight water. Here is the proof. Look at this water rate up here compared to the oil rate. Look at this water rate, 650 barrels water for 25 barrels oil right away. The well is uneconomic. If you don't have water disposal right there, and it looks like it's a very small pool, the well is uneconomic. So once again, the vertical produced more than the horizontal by a huge margin. So I will once again repeat, uh, when, when people wanna share their concerns about companies with me, um, and you want to dive into the engineering or the geology issues, please do your homework. Don't 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 say dumb, stupid things that make no sense because vertical wells do produce more than horizontal wells in certain cases, and especially in the manville, and especially in the uh, when you're comparing a new reservoir vertical to a depleted reservoir horizontal. Um, okay, so. Those were the two uh, horizontal wells. Here is another example. So we have this pool here with a few verticals with one horizontal well. And here is your horizontal well. So came on at 40 barrels per day and died pretty soon thereafter. Here's your two vertical wells. One came on at 125 barrels. The other came on at 300 barrels and stayed there for about a year. 
So what, why did these produce more? Because the vertical wells are in the juice of the reservoir, the thickest part. The greener is the thicker part. The light green where this horizontal is, is in a shallower part. Uh, or sorry, there's net less net pay in the horizontal area. And it looks like they have an injector right next to it. So they were running some sort of scheme trying to push water into the zone and it just didn't pan out the same way the vertical wells did. Um, so generalizing the two different ways of drilling, uh, not a good strategy. Uh, I would say look into what exactly is being drilled and then you can make a conclusion. And the final example, this is Sojourn Energy three miles away from the north fields that Prospera has near the town of Macklin. Massive laterals drilled. So long, super long laterals drilled in 1993. Okay, pretty good wells. Came on at 150 barrels and in about three to five years, 50 barrels and then died. Okay. Then we have Sojourn Energy came, uh, Sojourn Energy came here in 2020. And they drilled one vertical well right there. Produced at about 50 barrels. It's been producing, uh, let's say, let's say 35 barrels, 35, 40 barrels. Been producing at that for more than two years. Here are your horizontal wells, three of them. Came on at 60, 65, 70 barrels. Um, this this one is 70, this one is 30, this one is 50, and they have a low decline to them, some declining a bit more. No water flood here, uh, so it's natural water drive, which we see because the water rate is once again going up naturally. And this is the closest adjacent pool in the Manville that was drilled most recently um, to, Prospera, to Prospera's northern pools. Not the ones they're drilling right now, but the northern pools. And hey, the rates are pretty decent, 60, 70 barrels. And look at these laterals. They're only 400 meters long, not, not even. They're, yeah, maybe maybe three, 400 meters long. For Spira is drilling seven to 900 meter long laterals. Okay, we, we don't wanna get into these super long ones because heavy oil doesn't like to flow from that much horizontal distance. We want these smaller ones and we want seven to 900 meters, double the reservoir contact, you can run your own, whatever sensitivity you want. If this is the production from 300 meters or 400 meters, what is the production from seven to 900 meters? Same zone, three miles away, drilled in 2020 with the latest technology, horizontal, and then you have the one vertical, which shows you that the vertical actually has pretty good, the vertical produced more oil than one of the horizontals, at least maybe two of the horizontals. Once again, proves the point I made in the previous slide uh, on those. And that's that. So uh, hopefully people found this uh, enjoyable. I, um, like I said, I, I wanted to do this for a while. I just wanted to wait for the drilling rig to actually be on site so that um, I had confidence in the company to execute on that part of the program. And we didn't see further and further delays. So now that we're there, I will continue to, to track the rig I will continue to track the production results and uh, will continue to share as much as I can um, and keep an eye out for this, these kinds of similar due diligence sessions on my other private placement um, entries and the other junior companies that uh, White Tundra has participated with. Um, so as I said at the beginning of the presentation three hours ago, we are going into more of a focused White Tundra going forward. Uh, the focus is gonna be on the junior ENPs the focus is going to be on the small to mid caps that are in the portfolio and then on running the white tundra petroleum entity um as as an enp so really gonna share more quality deeper knowledge on those companies um, as well as addressing all the concerns so i i have no issue with anybody bringing on concerns about the company so if you have anything that you see that's out of the ordinary um i i really want to address it or i want to do research into it if i haven't thought of that one uh, and and discuss it with management, figure out what's going wrong or what the answer is to the question and then disseminate it to the public. Um, going forward, I've been a little bit delayed on my newsletter, uh, but I do want to get that out here in the next couple of weeks where I can share any kind of random DD that I find uh, over the course of every month. 
um, and then kind of just, you know, share things that way and then have these long winded uh, DD sessions on one or two of the holdings um, sort of every, every couple of months and uh, keep sharing the sort of adjacent wells and pools that way. Um, I should just be clear here. Nothing in life is risk-free. Nothing in the world is risk-free. There's, there's always a price you pay for what you're doing. And that especially applies to the oil industry. If you think you're going to come in here and you're going to make money uh, by having a pessimistic view uh, or by going in there and saying this thing could fail or that thing could fail, uh, or you think that every single well in the world will work out, um, like I hate to be blunt, but that's that's not how it's going to work. This, this is a real world industry. We're not building an app. We're not building a video game. We're not doing things in a in a data center somewhere. We're actually going and drilling kilometers into the ground, uh, and then horizontally kilometers into there. So things can always go wrong. Um, things can always go right. Things can always go really really right, and you could discover something completely un un uh, unforeseen. So. Um, I think there's 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 a uh, sort of misunderstanding that the you know we're in the stock markets just to make money and that everything should make sense. Um, that's that's not usually the case, and especially with junior ENPs, uh, it's not usually the case. So uh, let's let's just be cognizant of that. Let's also be cognizant of the fact that there used to be four to five hundred companies in the Canadian ENP market ten years ago. Today there's about one fifty. So when you're trying to say that these companies, uh, XYZ company is the bottom quartile of the bunch. What you're essentially saying is that it's the top one third of companies when you look at it from a 2014 companies and what remains. So everything has been high graded to a major extent since then. There's still companies that have suffered through the cycle and they're just now coming back, poking their little seedling outside the dirt um, and, 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 you know, they're, they've got some money, they've got some issues, they've got some hair on it. Um, and I will want again, uh, once again, repeat this. If you want a completely de-risked company, if you want something that has no, absolutely no risk on it, um, no hair on it, no caveats, no nuances, um, you're not going to find it in the ENP space and you're definitely not going to find it in the junior ENP space. So we agree with these risks. We agree with the, um, kind of the issues that we're taking on along with the positive rewards. Um, and there's always a risk reward that you have to decide. I can give you all the DD in the world, but the risk reward on the investment you're making is, is completely up to your own metrics of how much risk you're taking on versus how much reward can be gained um, from that investment. So, you know, looking at something and just saying it's a smaller company, therefore it's risky, um, you know, feel free to continue on with that ideology all day long. It it really doesn't bother me because that's kind of the base case of how people look at these things. Um, but I'd, I'd, I'd welcome you to compare the junior ENP today to the junior ENP of 2012 or 2014 or 2006. Uh, they are vastly different beasts. They have evolved uh, in a major way. Um, and the ones that are out there now, they're just got more more bigger assets that they have under them. They're not going out with two sections of land. They're going out with uh, 40, 60, 80 sections of land and huge production growth potential um, from the bottom. So I think I will end it there. Um, sort of appreciate, uh, well, I do appreciate everybody joining in here and uh, my DMs are always open. I've got a lot of questions on Prospera. Uh, my email is always open and uh, I don't receive that many calls. So I think that's not the preferred way of contact that people... Uh, prefer, but, you know, so be it. I've uh, ended up, uh, you know, talking to quite a few people uh, still, but but more so through DM and email. Um, so if you've got anything else that's bothering you, let me know, because I do want to address it as much as possible, um, you know, within the, the, the re reasonableness of the information that the company can provide to me, and then what I can find through public data, and my own interpretation of the situation. So, you know, if we if we want to live our lives by just sitting in a corner and, and waiting for nothing to hurt us, you know, so be it. That's that's how you can choose to live your life. Uh, saying that, oh, the it might rain today, a uh, car might hit me, bus might run me over, homeless zombie might uh, knife me to death, and uh, I might spill hot coffee on me and burn myself. You know, sure, you're more than welcome to sit at home and, and just relax. Uh, but I think, 
you know, the world really doesn't get ahead from from that sort of thinking. Um, it it gets ahead with with uh, optimism and uh, de-risking things too much as possible, and then we and then it's straight risk reward. If you think that risk is worth taking on with the with the adjacent reward, then you do so. If not, then you move on to some other opportunity. So that's the way that I've always uh, conducted myself, and it's the way that I will continue to conduct myself, um, sort of no matter what. So scared money makes no money, and uh, I think I'll wrap it up there. There's a few questions here, so. I will, uh, yeah, um, yeah, th there will be a replay on YouTube here very shortly. So I will put it on there. Um, I will just say that they've been uploading in 4K. So it does take a little bit longer. And also, if you watch the video right as it as it uploads, it's going to be in, in some really poor quality. So um, the other qualities are getting uploaded. They just take a lot longer to process. So um, just be patient uh, with that. And um, yeah, I, I I will say that my presentation schedule has kind of gotten out of whack with what I had on the website. So I fixed that up. I updated my portfolios to October or August 31st. Um, nothing major at all happened in the last uh, three months. So, well, two months. So just percentage changes. There was no new uh, additions. There was no new subtractions. Um, I did trade trade some companies in and out, some of the high high risk um, high beta companies um, during the drawdowns and then sold them probably two weeks ago, uh, including some warrants. And then also one of the most hated ENPs out there uh, that gets bashed on, but um, hey, they carry a lot of leverage. So I'm happy to uh, take that, take on that, that risk per se uh, and make money in the short term. So all those positions have been exited, uh, leaving me with just my main core holdings and um yeah, I will update the presentation schedule here very shortly um, once I know what's going on. I can say for sure that the shale update, the US shale update will be next Saturday. Um, yeah, not 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 this Saturday, but next Saturday, September 8th, um, because my uh, subscription to Novi Labs is ending on that day. So it would be illegal for me to hold any data uh, from their software after that. So I will I will share it on that last day um, September 8th, it has to be a Saturday because the thing ends on a Saturday and, um, yeah, I will share that. And then I will put on the rest of the presentation schedule, um, from there onwards, there's, there's some very, very nice ones I want to share here, um, on the infrastructure valuation on well logging, uh, reserves evaluation and the Colombia and Argentina update is still to come, uh, along with some of the other files. I, I can't remember what exactly. So, We'll keep on keeping on and uh, hope everybody has a great uh, long weekend. I think I think it's a long weekend in both Canada and the U.S. So uh, enjoy and uh, burn lots of gasoline and jet fuel. And we'll catch you the next one.